What's up? Welcome to the One Within All to another episode of Interverse, and it is way more fun to do it live. Happy Sam Hain, Halloween, whatchamacallit. We got a spooky episode today. <laughs> we are looking at a, an extremely weird book from 1733 called The Temple of the Muses. I don't know how you would say that in the French, Le Temple, Le Temple de la Muse. I don't know. French are weird. We have a super, super cool contest, uh, not really a contest, giveaway, let's call it a giveaway. Mario has printed some of the artwork that we're going to be talking about out of this ancient tome, the Temple of the Muses. It is the chaos and the origin of the world. We're going to look closely at that image so you'll get a chance to see it. At the intermission between the first and second hour, we'll be doing a giveaway, so I'll explain the rules to that as we get closer to it, but let your friends know. Join this live chat. It's where all the fun people are tonight on Sunday night. And Mario, there's not enough good things I could say about you, buddy. <laughs> You're one of my favorite people to collaborate with. Professional on all levels. Got the aesthetics. Got the audio quality. Got the good-natured, down-to-earth, humble, genius thing going on. So thank you for picking Interverse to do this expose of uh, an esoteric piece of literature that you found near where you live tell us more about that and welcome to the show mario thanks dude much appreciated that was a great intro uh and the feeling is obviously mutual so i figured you were the perfect person to run some of this stuff by and yeah this is a really really cool uh discussion that we're gonna have here and you know it's just funny how life works out you know and you meet people and you come across things you never would have come across otherwise and this is definitely one of those examples. Um, I have to give a huge shout out to Graham and Carolyn. And so uh, they are the couple who loaned me this book and who introduced it to me as well. And so I would not have gone down this rabbit hole. I haven't, um, you know, I wouldn't have researched this artwork to the degree that I did unless I came across this book in person. And I actually have it right here. So I might as well show you guys real quick. And uh, it's a beast. So <laughs> give me one second. Yeah, dude. <laughs> and I didn't even introduce your channel. I think it's obvious. Oh, but... no worries. It's all good. I'm Mario from Symbolic Studies. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, if you guys are interested in my stuff, you can go to symbolicstudies.com. I'm all over the place. I'm on YouTube, uh, Instagram, you know, Twitter, TikTok, things like that. So uh, hopefully... People from my channel came over here uh, to get into some of this stuff with us. Uh, but this is the book right here. So as you said, it's from they don't 17... make them like that anymore. No, they don't. And that was really the thing that blew me away with this. Especially because is... the people were littler, too, back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I was amazed when I first saw the artwork in this book. And that is really what drew me in. And Graham, who collects these books, that's what draws him in too. So he loves the artistic value of what's in uh, some of these books. And for people who don't know, you know, I've been a graphic designer for 20 years, pretty much. So I have an eye for art. You know, I'm not saying I have the best eye for art or aesthetics or anything like that. But, you know, um, I can spot like good quality art from a mile away. Conversely, I can spot poor quality art, I think, uh, as well from a mile away because I've made a lot of it, you know, and so I've spent the last 20 years refining my eye, you know. Um, and so when I first saw these prints, I was just completely taken back by the quality of work. They truly do not make them like they used to. That is for sure. And so the first print in this book 
is what really, really got me going. And from there, you know, I just went down this rabbit hole and I was like, you know, I have to put together some sort of presentation or discussion about what I'm seeing here because it fits in line with a lot of the things that I'm already researching. And I think people out there will appreciate some of my findings. Yeah, there's it's all perfectly aligned with what I'm interested in lately as well. And, you know, a lot of the research we do, we're studying big picture authors. And so what part we're zeroed in and zeroed in on and focusing on at any given moment can kind of jump around the yeah. massive historical scene that is the esoteric, the occult, religion, mythology. But this idea of the origin of the world and chaos has been particularly poignant in my recent reading. Mm. Um, been getting pretty into Alexander Higgins. And this is okay. a newer printing, but this is a book from 1823. So, ah, the best stuff has already been written. <laughs> right, know? right, right. Like this guy, um, you would really like his work. He's it's, this is like the Bible of Bibles. Okay, so he is cov covering and syncretizing through language and etymology and symbolism and astrotheology all of the major world religions and spiritual traditions and making. You know, like this is the uh, the Dylan Sicosio of 1823. Wow. <laughs> but but he's like, you know how it was back then with less distractions. You know, he's probably put it in 12 hours a day for 20 years to come up with this wow. book. Like it's massive. And they even I heard let Higgins into the Vatican archive at one point. So he had Whoa. access to things where it was like, you know, not as dangerous to the power hegemony for him to find stuff out because it wasn't like going to go around the world or go viral the way books were expensive, you know, sure, the way it sure. is now. So a lot of the information Higgins had access to, and probably some of the ideas in this book, the temple, of the muses from 1733, they're not really, you know, those ideas aren't as accessible to the modern mm -hmm. seeker. The internet yeah, is true. as big and wide as the internet seems. It's actually a lot more narrow and controlled <laughs> than it looks. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Very cool, man. I'm interested for sure. Um, the so fellow yeah, the chaos me... and the origin of the world. That's kind of where I started. But like, I've been yeah. reading that kind of stuff in Higgins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the fellow I was just going to say who um, let me borrow this book very graciously. I'm so lucky to have it around. Uh, this artwork, too, by the way, it is like another thing to see it in person versus seeing it here in this slideshow that we're about to get into and everything else. Seeing it in person is just completely next level, you know. Uh, but he also printed up the artwork that we'll be giving away as well. And so I'll show that off uh, real quick, too. And also, I'm giving away an elemental study packet along with these posters here. So Mario's elemental study packet, I have that. You basically get a really handy one page of all the correspondences to the elements. So let me make you big. Nice, nice. So there you go. So it's a really high quality print, archival grade uh, inks and paper and everything else. And you'll so... see it up close in the slideshow later on, folks. Yeah, 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 exactly. So anyways, it looks great. Um, were these woodcuts for printing? No, not woodcuts. They were engravings. Uh, I'm not sure the material, it was a metal, but uh, woodcuts. That's just um, as crazy. Don't have kinda. as much detail. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So once people see the artwork, they'll understand the quality that we're talking about. Um, and so essentially, you know, most of the points that I wanted to get to are in the slideshow. So I'm happy to get into that whenever you want. If there's other okay. thoughts that you want to get off your chest, uh, feel free, man. No, no. I mean, I noticed that it was a pretty good sized slideshow. I'm happy to start walking us through that. Uh, I love this topic. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, I'm sure we won't be hurting on things to fill the time. No, dude. We might sure, as well jump into sure. it. We got 50 people with us. We're cool. good to go. Let me just pull this up. I've got it already. And... All right, so while this is up, I'm not going to see the Rockfin chat as well. Just FYI, Rockfin people. So you tell me when to move forward, but I just got to say, <laughs> and Jen pointed this out to me, but like the detail is so tight. Your graphic design skills, you even textured the font on this decoding chaos to make it look like the ink print quality that the book has. That's so brilliant. I had to. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know this guy's a professional right here. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, Jen, she's always been great with pointing out some of the little details I have in my memes and whatever, too. So she's got a great eye. And I like her artwork, too. That's awesome. Nice. So yeah, yeah feel free and progress. 
so that's right. The so book. I just showed you guys. This is the book. Uh, again, really grateful and super lucky to have uh, an original copy around. And uh, this is what kind of like brought me into this whole rabbit hole. That is the Temple of the Muses. And so you can move forward. I got to make a quick point of um, yeah. Michelle, your beautiful counterpart, sent yeah. me a twenty dollars super chat. So. Not nice. only do I appreciate that because it's so kind, but it's the first super chat this channel's ever received because I only recently was uh, for some reason allowed to start receiving money. I don't know why what changed, but thanks YouTube <laughs> and thanks Michelle for being the first one. Appreciate that a lot. That's awesome, dude. I want to get there. I have to get 4000 uh I think viewing hours or something like that before I can get that. Oh yeah, it's tricky with 3 minute videos, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is. And so if you guys are digging this information and what's going on here, feel free and show some love in the super chat. So there yeah, you go. And uh, also definitely make sure you're sub to symbolic studies. I mean, this guy is one of the best teachers of this stuff in the quickest, most concise, but thorough format. I love it. Thanks, man. Yeah. So the version I have, unfortunately, uh, is in French. <laughs> and so I cannot actually read what's going on within these pages, but I found a I think really it's only good... printed in French and German from my research. Yeah, uh, they did uh, French, German, um, Dutch, and, and English. And so to have an English version would be completely nuts. But, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that there's been so many translations of this work because essentially, and we'll get into it here in a couple seconds, but it's Ovid's or Ovid's Metamorphoses or Metamorphosis. And so um, there's a lot of different translations. And as I was reading the various translations, you know, um, some are better than others. And there's elements of the different translations that I prefer more than others. And so I almost had to kind of pick and choose, you know, some of the things that I focused on um, reading these translations. But I did come across one that I felt like is actually like way contemporary, but still respecting the original work. And so that's just, you know, opening the book and showing. Yeah, you, there's um, a couple of things page. from Metamorphosis that I would like to talk about. And I translated from the French the first in, uh, text that goes with the very first image, the actual chaos image. Awesome. And so we'll, we'll be able to go through that. <laughs> man, French is funny though, man. That dude, uh, they're so brutal. He's even kind of burnt, like ripping on and burning the uh, artist of his own book. He's like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> they just can't, <laughs> they just can't help themselves. They're like so interesting, snotty little Frenchman of the 1700s. <laughs> but <laughs> going so, yeah, forward. Um, there you go. Yeah. So the Temple of the Muses, that's what we're dealing with here. Once again, published in 1733 in Amsterdam. This fellow by the name of Zachary Chatelaine uh, is responsible for publishing it. The lead engraver, the one who gets most of the credit is Bernard Picard. And his engravings are next level. That's one of the things that I'm really falling in love with here is kind of starting to track you know, these different engravers and artists from back in the day that were being commissioned to make like incredible works of art. And so there's another book that he's uh, mostly responsible for working on that would be worth decoding at some point. But uh, we'll have to get into that another time. Um, but there's 60 engraved plates uh, in this work. And as I was saying, most of the myths are from Ovid's Metamorphoses. So these aren't new myths, uh, but they came from Ovid. And so you can move on unless you have any thoughts. Well, I have thoughts on the metamorphoses, but let's continue yeah. with the slides. Yeah, I mean, it's all about um, transformation. <laughs> you know, Greek, uh, it means uh, metamorphoses, Greek for transformations. Uh, it was created in uh, the 8th century AD, you know, um, it's basically a long narrative poem by Ovid. Apparently it's 15 books, over 250 myths. By no means am I claiming to be like an Ovid expert now. I'm very focused as you'll see. And um, you know, I'm, I'm honing in on some very, very specific nuance information, mostly visually uh, in this first plate, but I had to obviously, you know, give credit where credit is due and let people know, like, where did all of this come from, you know? And so all of the stories in this book have to do with change and transformation. And so here I just put chronicles, the history of the world from creation to the deification of Julius Caesar. So when I say this type of thing, I know you get it, Mario, but I'm not saying it's only this. 
because yeah. mythology is multi-layered and there's moral st- aspects to the story. There's folk interpretations of the story. There's so many different layers and dimensions. But with that, <laughs> metamorphoses, I think, is the ex- exoteric, uh, the exoteric or the external world version of the metempsychosis idea, which is an important doctrine of the ancient mystery school tradition, which is the transmigration of the soul through various incarnations, the death and rebirth. And the sun, symbolized by the phoenix, is the exoteric version of the uh, metempsychosis in the form of the metamorphoses. So even breaking into like the green language of metamorphosis, (laughs) you have met, which is wisdom. I know that it's meta technically, and that's its own word, which is beyond. And then you have am, A-M, which is phonetically not really a stretch in any sense. And in some words, you see it spelled this way, referring to the sun. Am is the om, like when you see it as aman, (laughs) which is one of the versions of the sun. And then you have or, which is a name for the sun and gold. And then um, orf is pretty close to oaf which is a serpent, which is a, tradi- a wisdom tradition. And then uh, the fey, fray word, I believe, is also very, a fr- fray or free is uh, definitely a solar uh, god, <laughs> creator god. So there's a bunch of like the trans- the wisdom of the sun, if you will, is kind of like encoded in this name metamorphosis. And so when you look at the mythology of the metamorphosis going from the creation of the world out of chaos to the deification of Caesar. In my opinion, uh, what you're seeing is the destruction and renovation of the world repeatedly through various ages as taught from time immemorial in the mystery schools. And that each time that a new main character is sort of introduced into the poem, like by the time you get to JC, JC (laughs) for a reason, uh, you're looking at the next incarnation of the solar deity. And, it, you know, it just goes from the way back, the, you know, starting with chaos and then Prometheus. And then um, it's very interesting. I'm kind of belaboring the point, but you're seeing the same being, which is the one, the being, the, the God, <laughs> the eternal source, if you will, uh, the prime mover, incarnating in various transformations and renovating the world as it goes through these different transformations. So, so it's like, you know, the whole, it's the metempsychosis or the journey of the soul of the entire world, which is, I think, part of maybe the esoteric reason why we have a soul, S-O-U-L, and the sun is soul. So there's a lot of that. Um, there's more, of course, in any mythology, many layers, but that's kind of my my take on it. And what, interesting, too, is I think that there's some psyopy <laughs> elements to it, like, or ways to interpret it that are a little off, like uh, some, there's some ball, ball earth shit in there too it's interesting yeah no agreed with that for sure um yeah and then also i'll just mention right now but you know the internal transformation you know uh internal alchemy uh the your inner verse you know your inner story the path of the fool you know and so yeah, that's uh, the metempsychosis yeah so just putting it more plainly i guess you know um and so absolutely man you're you're spot on so um let's progress here So I just wanted to share some of the artwork with you guys before we get into, uh, you know, the chaos image specifically. So as an example, you know, this is Atlas holding up the heavens, the vault of heaven, you know, the firmament. And so um, this is really interesting because when you look at other works of art uh, involving Atlas, many times he is holding up the world you know, itself. But here in this version, and I don't know how many versions there are like this, but he's actually holding up, you know, the sky, which I think is a really, really interesting sort of change from what we're used to these days. Um, And then if you go to the next slide, you'll just see kind of a close up of, you know, the the other interesting thing about Atlas is it's Salta, Mm. you know, backwards alchemically could represent like a salt pillar is a common um, thing. That's something that just yeah, comes to mind when right. I think about Atlas. Yeah, no, he, head. he looks like a pillar, dude, <laughs> for sure. That's like what he's symbolically representing. Absolutely. And I, I know we're going to zoom in on this a little more as we go, but people just check out the border around yeah, these images. Dude. Absolutely. The level of detail, man. 
people like wanted stuff to look nice. <laughs> what happened oh, to they us? Did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that blew me away, too, is just the little nuanced details of everything. How um, three-dimensional this looks, too. Like, it really has depth and pops out. It feels like you could touch the curves of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Looks like a statue, for sure. And so um, I just felt like it was great just to zoom in on at least one image, show you the quality of detail versus when you're looking at it from afar. And so we should have a couple more example images before we get into the chaos here. So Prometheus. Prometheus eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, um, and you know, obviously there's more to the artwork, but um, I just wanted to share that too. So I don't have too many thoughts on some of these example images other than, you know, let's appreciate the artwork for what it is <laughs> because it's completely next level in my opinion. Yeah, I know. I could get stuck. Just let's talk about Prometheus <laughs> for a while. But oh, I know. We yeah. should move forward. But let's make sure we talk about Prometheus a little bit. Go for I it. I think we will because we'll start really getting into the creation story and he's not very far from the beginning of that story. Right, right. Totally. That's true. Um, okay, so just another image here, you know, showing you guys the detail and some of the mythologies that are um, presented here in this work. Oh, and do you know which one this is in terms of what myth this is representing? Yeah, I believe his name is uh, Lycion, something to that effect. Uh, a king turned into a wolf, if I'm not mistaken. Is yeah, he the, fed uh, Zeus human bodies and tricked him. Uh, Zeus showed up as a disguised as a traveler and like Ly King Lycaon or Lycaon fed him <laughs> human. <laughs> and uh, so cannibal man kind of gives you your origin of the lycanthrope possibly. Yep. Yep. Seems like it. So once again, transformation, that is the key theme here, but whatever's going on with these little homunculi, I don't know, but maybe Juan knows <laughs> <laughs> he might, I would not be surprised. Uh, just another detail of showing you guys like what, some of these uh, borders, you know, contain. And so um, we could just look at artwork all day long, to be honest. And I basically have, <laughs> now that I have it in my possession, uh, just staring at some of these things and noticing just like the finest little details and knowing too that, you know, nothing is done by mistake. Everything is very intentional and there's layers upon layers here. Uh, you know, as an example, I don't even know what the story is about, to be completely honest, but doesn't it look like the dragon has breasts? You know, so yeah, what totally is that does. speaking to? Right. And so I might actually kind of have a hunch that maybe we can get into a bit later. But there's little things like that that I think are worth kind of acknowledging. And I feel strongly about that because of the main chaos image, you know, and once I really started studying it, just layers and layers of information started coming out. And I'm like, okay, I got gotcha. you. This is one you of promise we can talk about the titty dragon more because I have thoughts <laughs> about this too. Nice. Yeah, absolutely, dude. For sure. I think it would be worth talking about. You'll know the, <laughs> the, the right point to bring it up because uh, it'll oh, come you've up got it in mind show. later on and we're not going to lose this. Cause no, 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 no. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, good. Move forward then. Yeah. This is uh, from the Mount Etna print here, which is very Vulcan, big active volcano type thing going on. Here we go. Le chaos. Yes. So this is the first plate. And this is the one that really kind of uh, drug me in here with everything. And by the way, you know, um, the first couple of times I saw this book, I was looking at other books as well in my buddy's collection. And this book is just the one that really popped out at me, probably due to multiple things. But, you know, it's size, but it's quality and everything else. And so um, the second time I was able to spend time uh, with this work, I really started honing in on one aspect, and um, that's what led to all of these different revelations. So that is just what it looks like when it's opened up. So this is, once again, the first print, the first um, poem here. And then this is just a little bit of a zoomed in perspective on things. Yeah, you and people in the chat, tell us what you see in this chaos. I'll say before we start getting into like my information, I think there's more layers here that I'm just not seeing. So I think that it wasn't uncommon to encode perhaps letters from, you know, who knows what alphabets 
uh, symbols, subliminals. There could be mirror magic going on here. I think that there's a possibility that there's multiple things on different levels that are being expressed that I have yet to even uncover myself. In fact, I, I feel like I can confidently say that I know there is, you know, so once you really look at this um, and kind of like comb it uh, and really start parsing everything out, I think there's even more things that are waiting to be discovered here. I absolutely think so. And um, <laughs> do you want to start like analyzing it? I also have the, I translated the uh, French myth aspect of this page like where he doesn't really give the myth uh, that was kind of would have been fun if he kind of gave the metamorphosis verses 1 through 20 but uh, or lines 1 through 20 that tell this part of the chaos but anyway if you i if do have uh, time, some slides that kind of unpack that a little bit okay cool are you down for the reading from the actual book at this point it's not too long or do you want to save that you know i have uh i kind of uh, highlighted a couple of excerpts that I think kind of speak to what this is really all about. And then we can kind of unpack it on our own. I yeah. think. And, yeah. And then I, uh, the translations that you created earlier uh, will be appropriate to bring up here in a couple seconds, I think maybe okay, in the cool. next slide or the one right after. Yeah. <laughs> so proceed. Okay, cool. This is a lot to look at though, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. The chaos. So it's kind of cool. All of the prints, all of the plates, uh, they have the title written in four different languages. And I believe you have those ready to go, right? Is that what you're talking about with the translations or something else? I translated the main bulk of the text to the, the next page that goes with oh, this plate. I see. Okay. Yeah, well, in I terms know, of uh, the translation of this, it's the same in every language. Chaos, the origin of the world, uh, of the origin of the world. But... In the English version, it's just the chaos. They yeah. leave out the origin of the world part. I don't know why that would be. Right, right. I guess they so, probably um, figure you can read at least one of those other languages back then. Because <laughs> like when I'm reading Higgins here uh, from 1820, he will put entire passages in French, Latin, Greek, whatever, and no translation of it. Just like so-and-so says this, and he just drops it in that language like, of course, anyone that's reading my book would also be able to read that. <laughs> so <laughs> keeps you on your toes. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So um, let's check out these excerpts. And then if uh, you feel like you're not getting enough out of that, obviously, uh, let's unpack it further. Yeah, so I think so. Yeah, yeah. So this is one of the translations that I really favored. Uh, so this slide and the next slide kind of encapsulates what's going on here. So I'll just read it. Uh, the creation. Before the seas and lands had been created, before the sky that covers everything, nature displayed a single aspect only throughout the cosmos. Chaos was its name, a shapeless, unwrought mass of inert bulk and nothing more, with the discordant seeds of disconnected elements all heaped together in, in, in anarchic disarray. So that certainly is what it looks like. You know, what people say is that it's really all of the elements kind of mixed together. This is a primordial chaotic illustration showing you uh, apparently, at least symbolically, you know, what existed before there was order, you know, post chaos. And so then if you progress to the next slide, some God or kinder nature settled this dispute by separating earth from heaven and then by separating sea from earth and fluid ether from the denser air and after these were separated out and liberated from the primal heap he bound the disentangled elements each in its place and all in harmony so it's getting into this concept that everything was a homogenized mess this is what the primordial chaos was all about there was um the way some people have described it in other works is that it was all of the elements mixed together it was hot and cold mixed together there was very little differentiating uh between different elements that existed and that this kinder nature as he puts it here or god came and separated all of the elements and untangled everything and therefore brought order and therefore allowed these elements to do their thing. Um, and so if you want to read from uh, what you have, feel free. I think that would be a good time then. Oh, yeah, cool. So we're talking about the pleroma, the concept of the pleroma. 
Uh, so I'm going to, I will go ahead and read. And as those are more close ups to this image, cool. We'll look at it more as we go too. Let yeah. me pull this up while I read. That'd be even better. There you go. So it's not a super long read. I just thought it would be fun to have the actual text from the book for at least this page. Mm -hmm. And here is the image again, kind of zoomed out. It's the best we got. All right. So <laughs> here's a, the couple of paragraphs from the book. One must be a painter poet to attempt to draw an image of the primordial chaos, the supposed state of confused matter before the creation of the world. What form and arrangement will be given to these first principles on which every inexperienced philosopher is forced to admit his insufficiency in spite of the most ingenious systems that the spirit of hypothesis has produced? Revelation, whose goal was not to make us physicists, does not satisfy our curiosity here. It is content to teach us that God, by the word, drew all things from nothingness. The pagan poems, derived of this celestial light, and unable to understand that something could be done out of nothing, persuaded themselves that matter was eternal. Okay, I'm going to pause here. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I think, one of the most important parts to get into, Mario, in our riffing on this, is yeah. the eternality of matter. Whether or not, you know, because that is a, it, it's in modern times, it's not so much of a hot debate, but back back in the day, <laughs> and back in the early days of the church, the Christian church and the mystery schools before that, it was a big topic. So anyway, I'll continue here, but we should definitely make a note of that point. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, the pagan poets, they imagine a confused mass without order, which contained the principles of all the beings who, managing little by little, finally produced the universe. So the beings is a capital B, so we're talking about like the gods, you know, archons. But what they tell us on the subject of chaos and the origin of the world, far from giving us any clarification, only serves to make us aware of the confusion of their ideas and to what extent they disfigured the history of creation. So you hear this snotty French tone? <laughs> One is struck nevertheless by a few rays of light which pierce through the fables under which they have buried the truth. Compare the beginning of Genesis with what the poets tell us about chaos, creation and its consequences. In the latter, you will discover with, dif with difficulty the respectable remains of an obscure tradition, confused with the chimeras of a disturbed imagination. The inventor of this painting was not put off by the difficulties encountered in its composition. Less careful to follow the rules of a sound philosophy than to seek what can please the eyes <laughs> bring joy, and bring joy to the imagination, he elevated to his own and skillfully used what the poets provided. That was most suitable to adorn his subject. So did you hear that burn? He burned the artist. <laughs> Didn't follow the rules of a sound philosophy. <laughs> Beyond the clouds that make up the body of the painting, it represents an immense expanse of darkness. And hence, these very clouds are a bizarre mixture of water, fire, earth, smoke, wind, signs of the zodiac, and several other constellations, the order of which he has affected to reverse to give us some idea of the confusion which then reigned in the universe. We see Aquarius wedding the celestial lion, Sagittarius throwing his arrows at the Gemini twins, Capricorn attacking the crayfish, the scorpion defending itself against the bull, the virgin tramples the fish underfoot, the ram mixes the basins of Libra, the dog of summer barks at the serpent who threatens her with his venomous teeth, and the bear seems to want to launch himself into the sun. The stars are strewn about confusedly. One sees some attached to rocks, others in the fire or in the water, and even the name of the painter is written <clears> in the sky. <throat> he will perhaps be blamed for having brought into the composition of chaos the elements already separated and the constellations all formed, but it is permissible to deviate from the ordinary rules in a subject as ungrateful and bizarre as this on which even the most scrupulous observers of truth will always remain far below what was probably there. Yeah, so that's what he has to say about it. 
And I, yeah, I really think that his tone is very French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I'm glad you read that and pulled that up. So thank you. Um, there's a couple of things that it reminds me of, um, that perhaps we'll get into a bit later, but the note about the bear, you know, plunging into the sun, that's something that we'll be getting into specifically, uh, here in a few slides and we'll go through some of the elements here. Yeah. Right. So you just highlighted, um, yeah, I wanted to go right. back to the bear going into the sun. That is pretty cool. Yeah. 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 So I have slides later on that that'll get into that. Um, but so I, I have, you know, my own perspective on what that means that in my opinion is a little more holistic and makes sense. Um, here, what I have highlighted are the four winds, you know, so the idea of there being four winds is something that you'll see in a lot of classical works of art. There's some tarot decks that kind of depict the four winds. And generally they're in the four corners of like a tarot card. You know, there's this idea that the four winds come from a central location from a central Northern location, but here clearly they're all scattered about. And so um, they're all over the place. There's no harmony, you know, with uh, where they're positioned. And so uh, if you progress to the next slide, you'll just see a close up image of one of the yeah. winds. The winds, they have interesting names. You have the yeah. east wind, Aurora. I'm guessing yep. this might be the north wind, Boreas. It's kind of hard to tell if they're supposed to be a certain one or not. Um, right, right. And yes, they maybe... do. They all have their own uh, their own name for sure. Yeah, uh, Oster or Auster, the south wind. Yep. Okay, now we've jumped forward to... So we're now looking at um, some of the zodiacal constellations. Actually, I believe they're all there. They are all present, yes. So if you're going by the 12 system of astrology, then yeah, they're all there. And so that's what's highlighted right now is that you have these different pairs. And so it was really fun coming across this artwork for the first time, not knowing what to expect, having never been exposed to this idea of chaos being illustrated. And there's actually other versions of chaos being illustrated. Um, but from what I've seen, this one is definitely the most impressive and the most detailed. Uh, in fact, I was going to show another one and I just figured uh, it's fine. We can kind of do without it. But well, there that are... really does what you said is important because as somebody who's been curious about mythology my whole life, I've never seen chaos illustrated. Right. You know, the most you might get is like Final Fantasy video game and there's like a bad guy named chaos and it's like <laughs> that's right yeah just like a black cloud or something <laughs> yeah 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 but um exactly uh, you know this this is really interesting because it does seem to suggest the to even have the concept the, there's a paradox here that to even have the concept of a primordial chaos matter has to already exist to even conceptualize it that's and uh, right. it's why like it's why i'm actually on the side of the eternality of matter Mm -hmm. You know, and even in Genesis, we have um, the translation of the King James Bible, King James Version of the Bible, Genesis 1-1. Most people know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? But it, <laughs> I could be, I could go in on like a lot of the actual Hebrew on just that one sentence, but it, a more accurate translation is by wisdom, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth out of matter previously existing mm. <laughs> so yeah. you know it's not in the beginning it's by wisdom it's not mm. god it's god's plural which alayim is a trinity reference according to higgins and he has a lot of good information on that people say elohim but higgins says it's ali elohim so anyway there's multiple gods and then you have out of matter previously existing and the author of this book he's like Calling them, calling the ancients deranged and crazy for thinking that matter existed already. <laughs> that God, of course, created ex nihilo. But you know, when you boil it down to the philosophical simplicity of existence and non-existence being together in the pleroma, well, non-existence couldn't cancel out existence because non-existence doesn't exist. So existence must exist, mm -hmm. and there's no like, there's no beginning or end to that. It just is. So that's kind of like the present moment, the now. It always was, but. Why did there become order out of <laughs> chaos? That's a great question. But the 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 matter, the mother, the mater, the body, the womb, you know, all that was already there. There was already a womb before somebody started growing a baby inside themselves, right? 
Yeah, 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 exactly. You're hitting a lot, uh, upon a lot of really interesting points, for sure. And the question for me was, uh, what aspects symbolically brought the order, you know? And are there any hints in this illustration of the thing that created this uh, harmony, you know, between all of these elements and different parts and whatever? Um, it's the word, I think, uh, philosophically. You know, when yeah, you start no, that makes... this is this and that is that, that's like yeah. creating mental boundaries that have an effect on the physical world. That's my yeah. opinion. No, no, that symbolically, that makes sense with everything that we'll be getting into as well, I think, for sure. Um, so what people will see here are six circles and there are pairs in each of these circles. And, you know, you're going to see the lion with the scorpion, sorry, the bull with the scorpion. You're going to see the seagoat with the crab, etc. And so all of the different constellations of the Zodiac are present and they're all paired and matched together. And uh, if we proceed here, you'll see I zoomed in on each one specifically just so you can get a close up view of everything. So there you see a young ram with the scales. So Libra, these are the equinoxes. Yeah, it's my sun sign and my moon sign. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of hard to tell that it's a scale, though. A little bit. I would say that that one's probably the most ambiguous looking one. But uh, Funny because definitely... the scales are actually like one of the biggest in the actual zodi ecliptic. Yeah. And then this one also, very interestingly, all of the other pairs, you know, they're on the band of, of the zodiac that they rest on. And for whatever reason, this is the only pair that's actually not on a little band, as we'll see. So here you have a bull. So you got Taurus and then you got Scorpio. And you could see there, they're actually on the band of the Zodiac. Yeah, and it's easy to miss that the band is even there. Yeah. So do you make anything of the, you know... We could kind of go deep on a lot of these things, but do you make anything yep. of just this pairing? Like, do you make anything of the significance of the Aries Libra pairing or the Scorpio Taurus pairing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, for sure. I mean, that's a whole, you know, discussion if we wanted it to be. Um, so, you know, I think you know this, right? I'm sure a lot of people watching this know this already, but I really think that studying astrology, if you want to look at astrology and study astrology, you know, in a way that's going to give you a lot of new insights, look at the Zodiac as a pair of six signs and not necessarily 12 separate signs. And so acknowledging these pairs are really, really fascinating um, because it unlocks a whole new level of information, you know? So with Aries, as an example, this is when we enter what a lot of people refer to as the light side of the Zodiac or day side of the Zodiac. You know, it's the beginning of spring Gate of heaven. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's the beginning of spring for a lot of people. It makes a lot of sense that that Aries energy, you know, is what kind of like kicks off, you know, the Zodiacal new year. There's a lot of energy. So it's almost kind of like he is like pulling a parade of signs with him. He's like at the head of the parade, um, you know, and then the scales Libra were entering into what pe some people refer to as the dark or night side of the Zodiac at the beginning of each sign. There's equal parts day and night. So there's this whole interesting dynamic with Libra itself being the scales. Um, so, yeah, there, there's like a million things you can get into with every single pair for sure. So with this pair in particular, I've heard it described as the depiction of karma in the sky clock that Aries mm. initiates an action and Libra represents a consequence for every action nice. is an equal and opposite reaction because uh, like Aries that, rises, you know, it's the most high, it's the rise. And then by Libra, we're taking the fall. What goes up must come down. You got to get down to get up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Dude, 100%. Uh, that makes a lot of sense with Libra for sure. There's a lot of karmic stuff going on with libra as a sign and to be honest libra for me for a long time it took a while for me to fully appreciate like what libra is all about but this past libra season i feel like i just have this like newfound sort of thing with libra where i'm like whoa there is a lot of very powerful uh metaphors and themes going on with the sign so yeah what you just said makes total sense and now the symbolism of the zodiac signs being with their pairs is mm -hmm. important to just make note of this idea of the pleroma being all things and their opposite that that's not just a random artistic decision 
that is a philosophical decision to depict the chaos of having the sign be with its opposite partner opposing it's basically it's uh satan <laughs> it's shaitan in terms of the astrological meaning of that word meaning adversary what is directly opposed or across from so all things in their opposite when combined canceled itself out and make you know everything that is nothing nothing that is everything in a paradoxical way both sides are right when you say that there was nothing and then god created everything <laughs> whether you say matter was there or not previously, if it's all jumbled up and, you know, self nullifying like this, then that's it's right. like, it's not there. Yeah. That's an excellent point for sure. So there's more harmony and balance when they are uh, across from each other on the ecliptic. Right. Um, so, right. So here you have Taurus and Scorpio. And so there's a lot of very, very heavy things that we could talk about with this pairing. Um, and so, uh, Taurus was one of my like favorite signs for a long time. And I got really deep into bull symbolism. And so I do think it's interesting too, that I think that there are nods to some of the symbolic themes with each pair based on how shaded they are. And so, right. We looked at, uh, Aries and Libra, they're kind of in the light. And then here they're a little bit darker. And then when we progress to the seagoat and cancer, they're like clearly the darkest. And so I think that there's something going on with that that could be decoded as well. But if you have any thoughts on Taurus and Scorpio, go for it. Well, it just makes me think of sort of uh, the polarity of the generative principle that Taurus being. Uh, and also, you know, at a different time, processionally, Taurus would be the zodi zodiacal equinox of spring. Right. And it's where a lot of the sun as a bull symbolism comes from every version of anything that has bell or pell or pear or bear <laughs> like uh those are all also uh, bull bell bale type words that are referring yep. to a time where the emblem of the sun was the bull and the sun being the emblem of the creator um not that it the sun is the god but it's like the the best symbol of the god because it does this metamorphosis every day you see it go into the underworld and rise again and then it does a bigger cycle in the year so they're deriving when i say everything resolves itself to the sun it's because they derive the philosophy from looking at the sun it just is it is what it is and then the philosophy gets more complicated as society and civilization gets more complicated sure but like that's definitely pretty hard to uh <laughs> find a different origin for every for all the symbolism in that. So anyway, the generative power of the bull and Scorpio representing the generative organs themselves, or uh, that's like, you know, it's kind of like the two-sided nature of the sacral power, the life force energy generative power of create or destroy. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, that's sort of the vibe going on. Scorpio is the purity or toxicity of our, our creative power and then the uh bull is kind of like the actual bringing forth and doing of the work with the power itself so i kind of mm -hmm. look at them like like one is the uh the inner essence of the power and the quality of the power and one is the actual physical action being taken with the power nice nice i like that yeah that makes a lot of sense um one thing that's coming to mind is probably one of my favorite uh bull scorpion um works of art that combine the two and it's with mithras slaying the bull and so you'll see mithras slaying the bull and oftentimes most of the time if there's enough resolution and enough space actually within the artwork uh you'll see a scorpion pinching its testicles you know and i think that's really fascinating because when scorpio is rising in uh in the night sky or in the sky just in general taurus is falling and vice versa so that's one of the elements that's going on here with all of these different pairings is that when one is rising, the other one is falling. And under the tropical system, you know, you generally see the opposite sign in the night sky. Um, so when you're in Scorpio season, you're going to see Taurus in the night sky, you know. So and as you were saying with the sun, you know, the band of the Zodiac, that is the path of the sun. You know, this system of astrology is a solar based system but you know there's something very interesting that allows all of it 
to actually function and to go, which we'll be talking about here shortly. So um, yeah, feel free and move on. There you go. So now we have Sagittarius and you've got the twins. One of the things I always think about with this pair is the, I guess, uh, the nature of the arrow, you know, and it being something that travels. And to me, it's just really interesting that the symbol for Sagittarius, right, is an arrow. And then the symbol for Gemini is uh, Roman numeral two, essentially. So here you have the thing that actually moves and travels. And then you actually have what looks like a symbolic gateway. And the other thing that comes to mind, too, is that Sagittarius and Gemini are on opposite ends of uh, the Milky Way galaxy. And so uh, if you look at the Milky Way like a river or like an arc or a bow of some kind, some star maps illustrate Sagittarius shooting its bow along the arc of the Milky Way galaxy. And it's going to hit, you know, symbolically, at least uh, the twins. And so a lot of times the twins, their feet are dangling in the Milky Way. So there's these myths about uh, the twins bathing their feet in the river uh, something along those lines. So there is a very interesting connection between these two signs in the Milky Way. And so if you look at a star map, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah, man. And uh, it's interesting that we have Sagittarius pointing his bow down. Yeah. Because that's kind of an inversion of anything orderly. You'd never point a bow down. <laughs> <laughs> you know True. I mean? That's a good point, so- man. It's a very chaotic action to take. Like, you know, if you're w- watching the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once, if you point your bow at the ground and shoot yourself in the foot, you might jump to a different universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, the I, I noticed in the French for Gemini, the word has the root germ in it. So oh, Gemini really? is gemation, which is also like one becoming two. You know, your mitosis Ooh. principle. That's why I think twins come from the birth process of Taurus. Um, interesting stuff that, uh, you know, there's so much, (laughs) there's so much assault against the idea of the germ, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, they make it the bad guy, the germ man, the germ theory, Mm -hmm. it goes on and on. I mean, that's just a noodle that for on your own folks, but it's a thing. So the generative principle or power, like, I guess maybe you need to symbolically attack that if you wanted to slow down the population growth for whatever reason (laughs) i don't know there's a lot of reasons for it but the other interesting thing of note here is that sagittarius the sage sagax in latin he is uh on the only text in the entire piece of artwork which is the artist's Mm. name and you know what another thing about the artist's name is it was very confusing in the french i chose to translate it as the artist's name is in the picture like if I pull up the exact the actual translation, it's something like even the name of the painter is written in the sky. Uh, but in the actual French, it was and even the name of the painter, no, it is not written in the sky, not the name of the painter. I was like really confused. Mm. And maybe the double negative meant that it was positive. <laughs> Wasn't sure how to translate it. So I wondered is that actually the artist of this particular plate or is he one that did one of the other plates? Are they throwing us for a loop with chaos and giving us the wrong (laughs) artist name in the, in the image? I don't know. Random observation. No, dude, I'm into it, man. Uh, Very interesting thoughts. That's why I'm here. I love the fact that you pointed out that the arrow is pointing downward. That is, that's totally a key right there. That's fascinating. And so do you see like these little, we don't have to talk about it for too long, but just to the right of, um, one of the legs of Sagittarius, you see that within what looks like fire, you know, these little like circles or eggs or whatever. There's lots of little things kind of going on in here that, you know, I don't know if it's just artistic license or once again, if there's more to actually decode or I look at it like leaves. Okay. Or like buds off of branches and twigs and limbs. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's very possible. You know, the symbolism of the bud and the leaf is massively important to i mean oh yeah where where i'm at right now is i think that the length the letters came from leaves i'm pretty sure leaves were the first letters that's that important right right i could see that and that's very fascinating and we're actually going to get into 
some tree stuff uh, at some point. But I think this is a good time to point out too that you know, uh, depending on what part of the illustration you're looking at, sometimes you can't really tell if you're looking at fire or water, you know, and then just kind of this homogenized sort of thing where there's like no differentiation. So um, that's something that I think they did to great effect for sure. Yeah, and there's also this electricity looking aspect to it yeah which for 1733 just about the only electricity that you have much access to would be uh like the lightning in the sky which mm. is super important but i was kind of looking to see i thought i might have had a screenshot of a quote from higgins aha here it is so higgins in uh anacalypsis he's saying that the magi the priests of persia you know the ones who acknowledged or mazdi's arman and mithra as their trinity um, they held the opinion that God consisted of a subtle, ethereal, igneous fluid, mm. which pervaded all nature. And so that description, it really sounds more like electricity than anything. Fluid, mm. you know, a fluid fire, mm -hmm. <laughs> ethereal. So all that sounds like electricity and that they, they're referring to life force energy as you know, our electric bodies and all that. But what's interesting about it is later mystery school tradition, later priests took that idea from the Orient and interpreted as God is fire. So then they're worshiping mm. and they kind of get into the idolatry of actually worshiping the sun as if it was God. Cause like, that's the fire that never goes away. And then having a fire in the temple that, if you know if you did something irreverent around the fire or you let it go out they put you to death because that fire was god to them right yeah they oh have, yeah like, they would tell stories like oh yeah zoroaster got this fire from the sun went up into the heavens brought it totally. here it's been the same fire in this temple for generations and it, it actually is the sun you know they, they're doing all kinds of crafty priest shit but the, i think that came from misunderstanding this igneous fluid of uh ethereal fire being electricity my, just mm. my two cents i see a lot of electricity in this image um i go back yeah. to zoom out you might see more of it but it's like you can see it you know in these yeah. areas totally no i definitely see your point okay but yeah and fire you know any flame coming from an original fire you know i know there's myths from around the world where it's like they consider fire to be a grandfather you know so it's this very old ancient sort of thing um so here you can see the sea goat and the crab and they are the most heavily shaded of all the pairs which i think is really really intriguing for a lot of different reasons and there is this darkness that definitely is associated with the sea goat because it you know it corresponds with uh saturn and so saturn obviously you know uh corresponds with uh black and lead and things like that and it's in the winter and whatnot and then there's also a thing with cancer that way too in fact that's one of the things that i've bonded with uh, michelle about <laughs> because uh we both like horror movies and kind of some gritty stuff and whatever and she's a capricorn and i'm a cancer and i'm pretty convinced that there is this darker energy with both signs um so to me the fact that they're both shaded this way i think is very very intriguing um and so there's a lot to be said about this pair. You know, um, I know that philosophically, the belief. light represents awareness, consciousness, truth. So just mm -hmm. the idea of Capricorn and cancer being the gate that, of man and the gate of the gods, That's right? And like you incarnate through cancer, exit the realm through Capricorn. Well, where you were before you die and where you go after you die, that is completely shrouded in darkness. You know, those are very dark areas. That's right. Excellent point, dude. Yeah, for sure. That's what I was going to mention. Uh, mostly the gate of the gods, gate of man thing. Um, definitely. And it doesn't appear as though the seagoat is on one of these bands that I've been talking about, but maybe it looks kind of ambiguous, uh, but clearly cancer is on one of them. Yeah, it's kind of floating out of there on its own. Yeah, yeah. Hard to even tell that it's a seagoat. Yes, agreed. It's one of the harder ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to move forward here? Yeah, yeah, please. This is my favorite of all the pairs. <laughs> Isn't that great? Like a fire, Aquarius is like a firefighter trying to put out Leo. 
right, get right. without this fire. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a fascinating thread that you can pull at. And it bridges, you know, um, what's going on with Aquarius and what's going on with Leo. And so there's actually a lot of water symbolism that ties into Leo. Um, there's a lot of like uh, fountains and waterways that incorporate, you know, lion artwork and things like that. And so the fact that they're actually playing off of that, I think, is really, really cool and intriguing for sure. Uh, yeah. So what do you like about it? Well, I mean, it is the lighter stuff, so it's more detailed that yeah. you can kind of see and make out the details. But, you know, just in terms of the action going on between them, <laughs> like I'm a comic book guy. So this is more visceral of like Leo is the fire, you know, and we're put we're dumping the water on it, putting it out. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then the other thing that jumps to mind is how back to this idea of a fluid ethereal fire, you know. This is the pair, man. This is the pair, exactly. Because uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I call Aquarius before elect, elect Aquarius or elect Aquarius. I guess I can't say that anymore, but you know, because <laughs> it's more than it's an air sign, even though he's the water bearer. So he's more about like this fluidity that the realm actually is, and that right, what he brings isn't sim not just symbolically the water of springtime if you're in the southern hemisphere or the rainy season during winter if you're in the northern but also bringing flow itself as the regenerator aspect of you know the destroyer part of the trinity being also the regenerator that that time of the year things are dying but also it's to get rid of stagnancy and and uh, bring about flow and then there's also lion <laughs> <laughs> lions are important super important deity symbol all the time uh, uh all the heart symbolism that goes with leo all the heart symbolism that goes with uh various versions of the savior deity and the fact that in hebrew uh ari like aleph resh yod uh ari a r i that's lion in hebrew but also in many languages uh ari is river or r a r nice so so lion is that. both yeah exactly the that word where we get lion uh is referring to rivers and a fire sign of the zodiac nice dude that's awesome that makes a lot of sense um and also you know there's this serpentine connection with lions and so sometimes when i see rivers from an aerial perspective uh you know it looks like a serpent or a snake or whatever and then i've yeah, made dude. videos about it before uh but you know the urn of aquarius the vase of aquarius you know it holds everything basically you know so it's ether it's spirit it's vibration and frequency it's light it's energy it's also electricity you know so i think that's one of the metaphors that's going on with the urn of aquarius is that it holds this fluid that you're speaking to um you know in sure. the sumer in the sumerian astro theology aquarius the man was yah or mm. yahweh ah nice yeah <laughs> i'm into it you know he's right next to this pegasus square which is the garden of eden so when you say that that carry that it's holding like everything in his vase in a way yeah that's like um in an older version that's a an actual creator deity crafter craftsman demiurgos you know totally. the one that set all this in order <laughs> yeah know, like maybe who knows maybe the ancients had a different idea of like time maybe time began in the age of aquarius or something in terms of procession we don't know when they started counting procession or wh what what was where when it all started <laughs> you know when it went right. from chaos to order who knows right. maybe aquarius has some thing to do with that first cause that we're totally lost track of in this you know further degraded level of knowledge in the current age we're in don't know yeah no absolutely dude and i'll just mention it right now because you know people like to talk about the different ages you know and some people like to think about um us being in the age of aquarius you know but t depending on your system and depending on how you look at things um you know there's the case to be made that you know even though you know my channel and my research i follow tropical astrology and so we're in scorpio right now but who's to say that we're not actually in taurus 
So um, that's more of a geocentric way of looking at things. Manly P. Hall actually talked about this in one of his books. I, I know I've mentioned it on streams. I don't know if we've ever talked about it personally, you know, but um, if we're in the age of Aquarius, sometimes I wonder, are we actually in the age of Leo? You know, does that make any sense, you know, uh, given what's going on with these pairs? Or does it even make just more sense to kind of say, if you're uh, in one, you're in the, in the other. Age? Exactly. That's what I was just going to say for sure. And mm -hmm. so, and I'm not even, I don't have a horse in this race. I don't know what age it is. I, I don't know if we can know what age it is. You know, I don't know what kind of propaganda we've been subjected to, you know, things like that. So I'm very open to that debate. Yeah. Um, in Dylan's work, he does the calculations based on what Julius Caesar's astronomers had reckoned mm. about the procession and by their system. And this is the guy that, you know, where we got the calendar we're currently on. So yeah. part of the problem with this, our whole conversation of like, what is the age of Aquarius? When does it start? Is it like on whose authority, <laughs> you know, and that's no one's authority is really the authority. And I, I totally get that. But considering that we're using the calendar named after the guy, his calcul or his astronomers calculations would have put the age of Aquarius beginning around like 1743 or something. So like right before this would have been like the yeah. dawn of the age of Aquarius when this book was published. So exactly. that's very possible. Yeah. 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 That's fascinating for sure. And then also there's other sky clocks out there, not just the ecliptic solar based sky clock, you know? And so we'll get into a little bit of that, um, you know, later on. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's like we didn't have, <laughs> it's uh, interesting. Kronos in terms of measured time requires language. So that's part of why like logos is the origin of the world, which mm. is the word with L added to it. <laughs> mm. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, the world like whirling above our heads, the Kronos measured time and form the sky clock before that it would be chaos. Cause you know, if you didn't have a language, things would just, you would just right. sort of be in this soup of the eternal now. And there wouldn't be like a, all this story that we have. And without the story, where's the history, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I love that you bring up the word Arius or a Prometheus more. <laughs> right are, on, you think yeah. we can, are we at a decent place for an intermission pretty soon? You know, um, I'm cool with putting it anywhere. So I've got many... nothing else going on tonight. Okay, right on, dude. I'm happy to do that. So, you know, I don't know if quantifying things always makes the most sense, but as an example, so we are on slide uh, 24 out of 48. So well, that's actually, the halfway point, the literal that's the halfway, halfway point, point, dude, for sure. Let's go for it. Yeah, if that okay. makes sense. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to give like your plugs, talk about your channel, what you're excited about, how people can connect with you. I want to make sure we hit that twice in this combo. So nice, please dude. give it, give it full <laughs> breadth of detail. It, You've been doing killer live streams lately too. Loving to see your channel grow, man. Thanks dude. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I'm focusing a little bit more on live streams these days, uh, but very, very soon, I think I'm going to start making longer form content, longer videos. So for the last couple of years, you know, I've been making um, videos based on the sign during the sign we're in. So right now, right after this presentation, actually, I'm going to be researching Scorpio again. This will be like the third or fourth time that I've done Scorpio and I'll be making content based around the sign. And um, basically, you know, symbolic studies is just a way for me to get a lot of this research off my chest, you know. Um, and if people are interested, you know, in tarot readings or what I call study sessions or consultations, people can certainly reach out about that. Um, but if you go to symbolicstudies.com, you'll find everything there and how to follow me and find me and, and all that fun stuff. I do highly recommend people follow your socials and watch your great content. Super awesome, informative, concise, you know, you got, <laughs> if you got time for two or three hour long universes, you can do some really quick <laughs> bite-sized gnosis drops from Mario, but also this guy knows his stuff and is really good at bringing the subjectivity of the personal experience to a read for clients and the tarot readings he does. Like, also, I believe you could just get lessons on the symbolism of the tarot from Mario if you're aspiring. Oh yeah, yourself. Oh yeah, uh, you it's been really awesome. With that, asking questions rather than making predictions or prescriptions, and I appreciate that. I've learned from you. 
Thanks, dude. I really appreciate that too. And so, uh, yeah, people have reached out about doing all sorts of different study sessions from tarot stuff to, you know, people have had different myths that they wanted more information about, or uh, I've done dream symbolism for people, you know, so it just kind of, it's ranged, you know, and it's really expanded. Some people have hit me up and they just wanted me to review like their artwork and review their poetry and stuff, but it's like astrologically based. And, you know, uh, essentially if there's anything symbolic that you think I can help out with, um, obviously just reach out and we can chat for sure. So much appreciated yeah. dude. And during this break, we're going to give away, or we're going to give the details for the, uh, the posters, right? That is right. So, um, the original plan was we were going to do one on Rockfin and one on YouTube, but Rockfin's a ghost town. No one's even commented a single comment. Everyone's on YouTube <laughs> okay. tonight, which is fine. It's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. You don't have to go anywhere if you don't want. We are doing this whole episode on the free side. So we are taking an intermission like I normally would, but it's not going to cut off after that. We're going to stay here with you guys on YouTube. So uh, happy Halloween. <laughs> you guys get uh, the free second hour this time, which is fun to do sometimes. And this is a really cool, unique episode. So I'm glad we're doing it that way. Now, listen up if you're kind of spacing out. Hey, I'm talking to you. <laughs> if you want to get a poster of the chaos, this image we've been talking about, whenever I begin the music and we have our three or so minute temp uh, intermission, type in the chat the word chaos. <laughs> and that's going to count as your entry. Please only do it once. And please actually try not to. Uh, I know this is a big ask, but try not to be too chatty during the intermission. So I just have a list of people saying the word chaos. So I know that that's an entry. I'm going to take that and I'm going to randomize that in a way that I won't say how, and two people are going to get <laughs> a print out of it. So uh, we're going to go ahead and do that now. Take our break, type chaos in the chat. And uh, if you want to get, get that poster and we'll work out the details of how to get it to you after that. And then we're going to come back and enjoy looking over more of the details of this really wild piece of artwork. And Mario, I just have man, to say, fun. yes, indeed, I agree. We haven't really gotten to the juice or the gravy yet. I and know so, the second hour is probably going to be longer than an hour. <laughs> the, the really good stuff is coming up. So I just want to say that, you know, um, that's just kind of the deal. And so the stuff I personally am the most excited to talk about will be just after the break. And so how long is this break going to be? Oh, we got about three minutes. There will be maybe a little longer. There will be an actual timer on screen that you can see. Nice. And thank you guys for being here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Mario. I'll see you guys uh, in a couple minutes. Enjoy the little break. Get, get some tea. Go to the bathroom, whatever. And here we go.
Awesome. Yo, we're back. All right. Thank you, everybody, for typing in the chat. And uh, I'm going to do a random number generator. Mario, welcome back. Thanks, dude. It's good to be back. Digging you your, uh, your while graphics I do this, and stuff. Uh, contest shit. Yeah, yeah. No, I just was going to say that uh, your production stuff is uh, getting really, really awesome. So I definitely felt the hypnotic vibes during that little break. <laughs> and then uh, obviously, too, the song is by someone named Chaos, right? So that's pretty rad and appropriate. Yep, that's how I ended up finding it. So nice. here it is. I did a random number generator, as you can see over here. There were about 30. Oh, ooh, there's a couple of latecomers. I think we had exactly 30, though. Okay. And uh, I did one through 30. We got a two. So scrolling back up, that would be Stacy Sunshine. Oh, sweet. We have a winner. Nice. Now uh, we'll do another one, right? We're going to do two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Sweet. And it looks like maybe we got 31 now with uh, Justin. So we're, we're counting you in here, Justin. Mike, welcome to the stream. Here we go. Live on the air. Generating number 31. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, congrats, Justin. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you nice. slid in just in time there. Yeah, Truly yeah. random, you know? Truly random. Definitely. Cool. Well, I'll be in touch with these guys. So uh, thank you for entering. And thank you for doing this, Chance. Yeah, Justin, make sure you get a, a hold of either me or Mario on Telegram or something or email and we'll make sure that, or he will, he'll make sure he's the generous guy oh, that's yeah. doing it. He'll make yeah, sure yeah, that you yeah. get that poster. Thanks for the contest, Mario. That's really fun. Yeah, you got it. For sure. And the study packets. So um, this will be and awesome. And the study packets, man. Yeah, that's dude. good shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good just to give stuff away sometimes. So um, anyway, where were we? I believe... We were Looking at Virgo. Right. There you go. Okay. So uh, here you go. You've got the maiden, the virgin, standing on top of the fish, Pisces. Oh, my God. There's so much to say about all of these pairs, honestly. Um, the recent thing that was tripping me out that I got really into during Virgo season is the fact that oftentimes you will see the virgin holding a palm branch. And in my opinion, this branch is symbolic of who her son uh, is, essentially. It's like her holding a child, basically. And so Christ was known as the branch, born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary, things of that sort. So, And then fish symbolism with all of that, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But uh, that's the one thing I'd like to point out is that palm branch right there. Well, Adonis was uh, one of the versions of the, the Christ guy. He was born of his mother, Mir, or Mir, Ooh. Like myrrh that Jesus received as a baby. They gave him frankincense and myrrh. Mm -hmm. His mother's name was myrrh. Mm -hmm. And uh or Myra. <laughs> Sounds nice. like Mary. <laughs> and she was she got in trouble for the immaculate conception she had. Her family was upset about it, so they magically turned her into a tree. And that is the origin of the myrrh tree. <laughs> and Adonis fell from the tree as a kernel or a corn or a seed. There you go, dude. To Kronos. Kronos when was originally a solar deity before it was Saturn. And um, so this Ad Adonis is no different than Adamu <laughs> or Ad Adama or Adam, you know, the fall of man, Atom yeah. Ra, which is the old man uh, of the solar trinity to the Egyptians. There's so many versions of it, but just point th pointing that out that um, this Adam is the... Man, the atom of light or the atom Cadmon is a, no different than the idea of Mithras or Christ or Kronos. This is the person of the Trinity that actually is the craftsman that yep. builds all the stuff. <laughs> so, you got it. You got yeah. it, dude. That was a great breakdown. Uh, also, just wanted to point out corn. Um, it was interesting during Virgo season learning that corn essentially is like used to be a generic term for grain and Virgo is the grain goddess, you know, and so they're the corn grain symbolism with Virgo and then how that represents a solar deity of some kind, her child, you know, um, to me is really, really intriguing because a lot of times too, she's holding a palm branch in one hand and she's also holding grain or wheat in the other hand. And the wheat, uh, most of the time, is symbolized by spica, the star, like a, a spike of grain or whatever. So, um, yeah, that all fits for sure. Yeah, and uh, 
the corn Kronos. If yep. for anyone that's not familiar with the symbolism, it's K R N in Hebrew. That would be Kaf Resh. What's the N one? Oh <laughs> man, uh, is it Noon? Noon, yeah. <laughs> Kaf Resh Noon K R N. It's mm-hmm. the same vowels as corn or Kronos. Mm, the us yep. part is a Latin termination. Totally, and there's a lot of corn horn symbolism uh, with Kronos Saturnian. Is, type when I was in California stuff. a couple weeks ago. I was in Bakersfield, California, which is in a county called oh, you were? Kern County, K E R N. And uh, so everything I saw at that airport in the symbolism of what they were trying to promote about their area, I was like, with a grain of salt, like, are you guys, is this Kronos? What is this? <laughs> Dude, I'm pretty sure that's literally where the band corn comes from, if I'm Probably. not mistaken. No, yeah, because yeah. it's a K, it's corn with a K. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure they're into some occult shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. So and then you have the Quran, you know, that's KRN. Very interesting. Mm. Nice, dude. I like that There's too. There's many connections. It goes on and on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, awesome. So I think that's it for the zodiacal signs here, right? Yeah. But there's one more pair that is very, very intriguing. And it is. Well, this... actually, can I, I just thought I want to, I know Please, we're, we're being detailed here, but so we have the virgin, the mother goddess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On the fish, the Pisces. Yeah. This also reminds me of her epithet. Um, of all, many of the goddesses of, of wisdom have various epithets relating to wisdom, but uh, P, uh, <laughs> Sophia, uh, Pisces Sophia, or yes, dude, right? Yeah. So you have the idea of uh, Pistis Sophia. I'm sorry, not Pisces. <laughs> Pistis I mean, Sophia, but, but that's very yeah. phonetically close to Pisces yeah. or uh, Pisces. Mm hmm. Exactly. So, I understood what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah, dude. All of these pairs, man. I mean, seriously, you could just write a volume of books about what's going on with them. Because when so, you also think about um, Virgo, she is always hold with the corn, right? Or with the seed or the spica, mm-hmm. the wheat. And her opposing sign or her uh, complementary opposite, Pisces, is always two fish. Well, this makes me think of how... Um, when the monad divides into the duad, that when the second circle, the monad being the potter, the father, the pattern, the cre- the original source god that is never depicted, literally the chaos. <laughs> this is the chaos because you can't depict the chaos. There's no way to depict that which is everything and nothing all at once. But when that circle divides into a second circle and you have <laughs> the second person of the trinity, at the right hand of the father, as in it's a circle that is to the right, uh, you have a third shape, which is the Vesica Pisces or Vesica Pisces yep. in between the two circles. So when the monad becomes a duad, the duad itself actually is two and one. That when you create the second circle, even though you're counting one, two, mm-hmm. the two is two in and of itself. Two is two. Who knew? <laughs> two is two. <laughs> And so one and two gives you the Trinity because like a pregnant mother holding the baby in the womb and the mother and, and uh, child are one, two in one, that is the nature of the sacred geometry of the circle, the monad becoming the duad. So she's always holding her corn or her baby, her son. Yeah. And then the, the uh, Pisces fish, there's always two of them. So that's what I think is part of the importance of their, their symbolism as being opposers on the zodiac oh yeah no dude you totally got it exactly and then also too just reminding me of the vesca pisces and it's like the main part of um the uh ictus fish or the jesus fish you know and so it's like that is very intentional and so christ being the fisher of men and things like that and then also just the oceanic water symbolism with the great mother the queen of heaven with woman the womb you know, all these types of things, uh, obviously just goes on and on, but yeah, it I hear you loud and clear, man. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah, goes yeah. on and on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stop there. Cause now I'm about to get in, I'll open a can of Vishnu on this fish, but <laughs> we're not ready for that. Yeah. All right. Um, so there's one last pair, right? And so what you see here is a dog, right? Looks like she had puppies. Uh, and then you have this serpent. And so in my opinion, and people in Telegram, too, were talking about this. Uh, shout out to Davin, who supplied some interesting information 
about uh, what's going on right here. And I think that there's a few different ways of interpreting this pair. But admittedly, this is like not the focus that I'm like getting into with this presentation or whatever. And maybe this is something that we can unpack or I'll unpack at some point. Or if you have any definitive thoughts on like what you think uh, it is, I would love to hear it. But uh, on the next slide, I have my interpretations of what it is. And I know what you read earlier. Did it speak to that? I can't remember. But uh, I think you know the dog... what is interesting is uh, the word in French. Man, I feel like I need to pull up the I have. OK, I can pull up the exact word in French because it was sure. weird. Oh, shit. I did close it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Temple of the Muses. Come here. History. All right. Oh, I do have it. All right. Too many nice. tabs open. So. It's important to get the exact word that is used in French here. Why don't I just pull this over? Yeah. And zoom out a bit. So we have, okay, where is it at? Mm -mm -mm. It's up here. Okay. Canicule. Canicule. Canicule mm. is the word that they're using here. C-A-N-I-C-U-L-E. So. What's interesting is when you look that word up for the English translation to it from French, you get heat wave. Heat wave. Uh, Dog days there. of summer. Yep. Canis major, I think. That's why I picked Canis major as the. Oh, okay. That's why I decided Canis major was the translation. But this is not, this does not say Canis major. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think about canicule or canicule? Well, heat wave, I mean, obviously the summer, if I'm not mistaken, the um, rising of Sirius occurs during the summer, during like the dog days of summer. And so yes. that's why I think there's a few different interpretations here, which I have uh, on the slide that is it Canis. Well, Sirius minor? is part of the Canis major constellation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, okay. So I have them separate here. Good call, dude. Uh, so Canis minor major, which includes Sirius dog star. Uh, there's also lupus, the wolf, and then uh, I'm probably going to butcher it. Uh, Canis uh, Venetici, uh, basically in Boetes, it's the hunting dogs, essentially. So there's several dogs up there, you know, um, in the sky. <laughs> and so which one did these people refer to specifically? I think, you know, the case could be made for several of these, but it sounds as though uh, the serious connection is probably it. And then serpent symbolism obviously is like very very deep and so perhaps it's draco perhaps it's hydra or serpents which is uh the serpent that's being held by a fucus and so um you know i'm not saying i know definitively like what's going on here oh nice dude let's see what's up with that yeah i've got a plane sphere now thank you jennifer cool. great gift um and i was just trying to see you know if we're looking at these various versions of dogs in the Zodiac who mm -hmm. might be the exact opposite of it. So, oh, um, and maybe the Ophiuchus <laughs> or serpents are the ones that are best to look across the way from. And if you look, oh yeah. <laughs> oh shit. Okay, cool. I'm glad this is good. Learning on the fly. Can Canis major is diametrically one, 180 degrees opposed to uh Ophiuchus. nice and nice. serpents technically is like that serpents kaput the head of the snake is right there yeah so there it is man they're literally just you know this is a 13 sign zodiac that he put up not a 12 but it's actually now become a 14 interestingly enough because if we're putting everything in its opposite we never talk about who's the opposite who's the pair for Ophiuchus. i've never thought about that that's true i've never thought it's about that Canis either. major is that the one they're really hiding from us? <laughs> you know, I heard it even said recently, and I have no way to verify this, but I heard the claim just the other day that Sirius doesn't process. Mm. And, and everything else does, obviously, except the, and even the pole star supposedly processes. So like, what is that about if that's true? And I do not have the receipt on that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot more I need to learn about Sirius. Uh, well, it cool, seems dude. to be really important and like, yet very scanty information about why it's important other than that uh floods that come in summer to for the nile and that they would watch mm. for the rising of sirius and also sirius right. is siri or ceres 
So there's a goddess in it. And then mm -hmm. Osiris is O as in of series. Mm. O series. O serious. Right. Born of series. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Candace Major being a female is new to me, even. So that's a, I mean, females are, are giving birth. You know, that's your, is that your mother God? Dog is God backwards? Who knows? Right. I'm also very curious, you know, the fact that, you know, it is uh, a dog that's had, you know, puppies. Uh, it reminds me of the wolf that uh, raised um, the, the twins uh, the, of Roman mythology, um, Romulus and Remus, you know, and so they were raised by a she-wolf. And that is like one of the classic statues is that you see the she-wolf and um, the children, the twins are right underneath her, almost like suckling at her teats sort of thing sometimes. And so it makes me wonder if there's some sort of connection there uh, as well. I don't know. Um, and this planosphere is the greatest thing to have on hand for a podcast. <laughs> so, so handy. Way easier than Google imaging for constellations. Wow. Thank you. It looks like it's a great size too, man. That's awesome. I have one and it's like way smaller. So I need to get one of those big boys. Yeah, I feel like this uh, conversation, for me, one of the most viable things so far is to realize that Ophiuchus is opposed by Canis Major and Sirius. That nice. seems big. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. I love that. We kill to move on? Is that what you want to do? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. So essentially, now we're getting into some of kind of the heart of the presentation, I would say, um, from, I guess, just like the angle that I was the most excited about to, to talk about. And so you have this here, right? And so I think there's a few ways of interpreting actually what you're looking at. This this uh, this circle, this sphere with the darker uh, crosshatch, you know, over it. I'm realizing, dude, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but when I look at a lot of older works of art, uh, I notice it in a lot of like Freemasonic tracing boards where they present something that's very similar to this. And I think sometimes it does double duty. I think sometimes it represents the moon. I think somebody can make that case that it's the moon. Uh, I think you could also make the case that it's also the sun or perhaps an eclipse or the sun and the moon together. So I think a lot of times it's intentionally done to be interpretive. Um, but my hunch is that, and you'll see why, that I actually think it's supposed to represent the sun and the moon together. Although there is another body here that looks a lot like the sun, but I think there's a hidden nod that it actually is something else that is not the sun. Uh, and I'll show you why I think that. And so uh, what do you think about what you see here? What, what's, uh, what's your gut instinct telling you perhaps of what it is or what do you see? Looks like a moon, but you know what? I don't think there's any logical reason for this, but I'm just getting this feeling like the Argo or the the Argo, like the, the in this little very subtle thing here. Are we seeing the a boat? Kind of makes Ooh. me think of a boat. And I know it doesn't really look like one. And it's just an intuitive hit. Yeah. yeah also I kind of see, see like a candelabra possibly mm -hmm. holding flames but mm -hmm. the obvious it does feel like you're being led to think moon but there's always another story with this shit there is there is so i felt like this was okay yeah yeah i could see that and i again i don't think that the uh <laughs> <laughs> uh i don't uh, think could that, refer you know... to the lunar node though too mm. i think there's just more interpretations to be had with all of this stuff so you know, what I'm claiming here is not the end all be all definitive way of looking at this work, obviously. And that's one of the cool things that I was actually excited about by presenting some of this uh, imagery is what are people going to say in the comments, you know, in the chat elsewhere? You know, I think people are going to have a lot of interesting sort of things to uh, include in this conversation. So if you pr proceed one further, there is one last animal. Oh, sorry, my bad. Before we get there, here are seven stars it's really interesting i went around i counted all the stars i made sure to find there's some stars that are slightly hidden 
And then there are there's one small example of what could potentially be a star, but it's I, I really don't think it is a star. So when you count the stars that, in my opinion, look like they're supposed to be stars and read that way, you actually count seven stars. And you know me, man. I love the septenary stuff. I love seven symbolism. I know you know all about that stuff as well. So when I counted seven stars, I'm like, you know, are these the traditional planets? You know, like what's going on here? So I thought at the very least, you know, one of the last main elements that is worth going over are these seven stars scattered about. There's a lot here. <laughs> My first intuition is to question if we are getting specifically seven stars and obviously there are constellations allegorized in this artwork what constellation is this making that you circled here right yeah, yeah. good question i think if there's you know a good hunch or guess here uh, i think it's going to be something that i'll be talking about within the next couple slides <laughs> so <laughs> you know so seven uh, stars though uh, famous clusters of seven stars would be the Pleiades. Yep. And it would be the, the dippers. Yep. Those are the most famous ones for sure. Um, and so if we progress, are they to the all next... six pointed stars. Are there any that are different? Yes. There is one okay. that's different, which we'll get yeah. into right now. Oh, well, there's two. There's one that's also kind of occulted down here. Yeah. Can only see three. It looks like it's supposed to be six pointed though. Uh, in my opinion. But there's one that's obviously seven pointed, and that yeah. is that one right there that you're highlighting. And it's the one above uh, yep. the bear. And I think I know what you think that that is. <laughs> okay. you want yeah, me to people who follow my work on these shows, uh, it'll be no surprise to them. Um, but yeah, proceed. So here we are. We are close up on the last figure here. And so this one is different from the rest, right? I think we can say that there's the four winds, there's the pairs of the Zodiac. And then we were talking about, um, you know, the dog and the serpent and what that potentially means. This is the only one, the only figure that is like by itself, you know, and it's a bear, right? And so I was like, well, the first thing, the first thing I thought of was clearly it's a reference to either Ursa Major or Ursa Minor. Right. And Ursa Major and Minor each have seven stars to them. They are the dippers. They've been known as many things throughout the ages, including plows and wagons and things like that. Currently, most people acknowledge them as the dippers or the bears, the great bear and little bear. And then it tripped me out because one of the most important things about Ursa Major and Minor is this seven starred connection. And what do you know? This star just above the bear it has seven points to it, you know? And so I'm like, okay, well, all the other stars, it, you know, excluding potentially the hidden one, you know, uh, have six points to them, but this one has a very obvious seven pointed thing going on with it. And so that clued me in that potentially Ursa major and minor. And then I was just, just studying this little section a little bit more. And I started counting the rays coming from, this uh central white spot here which oh shit how many well there's a number of rays but in my opinion there's seven elongated rays so if you progress to the next slide you'll see what i'm talking about so here i've highlighted these seven rays one two three four five six seven notice that the ray to the left of the leftmost ray is hidden and blocked obfuscated a little bit by the paw and then notice that the one above the uh, ray on the right is also blocked by you know what looks like a rock or whatever and so to me this is another clear case in my opinion that they are encoding seven with this bear and so this leads me to believe that we're not dealing with the sun we're actually potentially dealing with the pole star and that Ursa Major and Minor, they revolve around the pole star. And so they have a direct connection with this star. And this star is in the center of the heavens from the perspective of Earth. So all everything in the night sky revolves around the pole star, basically. And so here you can see Ursa Minor, which is connected to Polaris. All the all the star stars again. Yeah, go for curious it. curious about where they land. 
Yeah, but continue. I'll yeah, bring us to that other slide in a second. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So you know, Ursa Major and Minor revolve around the pole star. There's a lot of myths that uh, involve these constellations and the northern sky. The northern sky is like my jam. It's the thing that I really, really care about. And it just like gets me going. It's the gift that keeps on giving because there's so much esoteric, brilliant, mind-blowing information connected to the dippers. And the dippers, you know, it's so crazy to me still. I probably say this on like every show I talk about this stuff on. But um, it's wild to me that the Dippers have so much information associated with them. And they are like the most commonly seen constellations, arguably, in the night sky. And the reason why they're seen a lot is because they're circumpolar. So they're in the northern sky, which means as opposed to like the ecliptic, which is the path of the sun, the signs of the zodiac dip below the horizon, right? And so um, they go through this cycle. Uh, the pole star... You know, my understanding is that 90% of the world's population has uh, been able to see Ursa Major and Minor for a very, very, very long time. And so they're always up there, basically, revolving around uh, this pole, this symbolic pole, this symbolic hub of the wheel, revolving around Polaris, right? And so if you go back just real quick to that bear image, one of the things that I just recently learned is the myth of Callisto, Callisto, and Basically, the storyline goes is that Zeus had an affair with this woman named Callisto. She was a beautiful woman. And if you know anything about this, dude, please chime in. This is new to me. Um, and they had a child together. Zeus's wife at the time did not appreciate that, turned her into a bear. And so her punishment was going to be uh, just to roam the wilderness as this bear. You know, she grew claws and fur and everything else. So she turned into a bear. Many, many years later, she was wandering around in the woods. This is just one version of the story. And she comes across her son. And she wants to greet her son and reunite with her son, who is now grown up, right? The son did not realize that the bear was his mother. And so as she tried to embrace him, Zeus intervened and basically put both of them in the night sky because the son was about to kill her. He was about to uh, kill her with a spear, I believe. And so they're now in the night sky and Zeus's wife basically wanted her to suffer. And so she turned them into circumpolar northern constellations so that they can't hide behind the horizon line. So they can't hide underneath the ocean so that they have to perpetually be in the northern sky and seen all the time. So she felt like that was adequate punishment for them was to be put in the northern sky so they can't hide and they can't have like a safe domain where they can just be and do their thing. And so to me, the fact that this bear is kind of over like what looks like an ocean is symbolic of that. Right. And then also too, notice that it looks like compared to all of the other uh, illustrations, it looks like it's in a cave. And so that's one of the other myths associated with Ursa Major and Minor is, and there's many, you know, but one of the thoughts is that it's symbolic of a mama bear and her cub in a cave. You know, that's what the firmament is. That's what the vault of heaven is, the night sky. That's what we live within is this symbolic massive cave and Ursa Major and Minor are in the northern sky existing within this cave. So to me, all of the symbolism just says, you know, that it's a Northern reference basically. And so uh, the Arctic, you know, a lot of AR words go back to the bear. So my understanding R. is like, remember lion river. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. So like Arthur Arctic. Um, I know there's a lot of other examples, you know, but there's uh, there's a reason why there's a polar bear and I don't think there's any other polar animals, you know, polar, whatever uh, there might be, but polar bear is like easily the most well-known and it's because the bear, bear symbolism, always is a reference to the northern sky from what I'm coming to understand, you know, most of the time. I also just want to say, since you're a, uh, you know, a word guy, uh, etymology guy, I think it's interesting that Callisto, her son was Arcus, right? And so they're in the night sky as Ursa Major and Minor. So there's that R again. But Callisto kind of reminded me a little bit of Kali and then California, 
Um, and then in on the California state flag, you actually have a bear. So it just made me wonder if there's a C A L I or L L I reference with bear symbolism. So that's not something I've looked into heavily just yet, but I thought that was kind of curious. There's so many things to riff on what you said. I'm going to do my best to catch everything that popped in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, dude. Polar bear is interesting because the Latin name is Ursa maritimus. So they're called a, they were called the sea bear before they were the polar bear. Oh, but, shit. Nice. You interesting. Know, but the, uh, uh, there's a lot of symbolism connecting the night sky to waters above, right? That's an old yeah, idea. Absolutely. Um, Callisto, I think I want to talk about that the most. So first you asked me, well, I'll start at the, at the end and then work my way back. But you asked about the name. <laughs> so I always just like put it through the filter of making R's into L's and L's into R's. So with Callisto, you could also have Car East, mm -hmm. Car, Car East, Christ. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so because she's, I mean, they worship the mother as the as God in a lot of versions of the uh, the savior deity who is the son of God. So to back this up, um, I mean, the fact that her name has car in it, <laughs> that, that's very car is hand it's the yacht, it's the heart, it's the vessel uh, that carries the spirit, you know, it's the jar that Jehovah or Aquarius is holding. Car, carry, car, oh, nice. chair, yeah. chair is a throne, chariot, yep. car. Oh, like so many things come from that phonetic, but uh, specifically the CRS and uh, or the CRST Christ uh, aspect of it combined with the nature of the story symbolically. Uh, it always to me, it always resolves to the Trinity. So you have Zeus, who is said by. Many of the ancient authors, before we got the Marvel Comics version of all of our mythology, Zeus was an eternal man and a maid. Ze all things are born of the womb of Zeus. So Zeus is mm. uh, Zeus at one point was the son of God and then took on the role as being the pater, the father, the you pater, Jupiter. Okay. So, like I was trying to explain at the beginning, the metamorphosis is the metempsychosis of the world itself and the sun being the soul of that world. Okay, so just like a boy grows up to become a father himself, eventually Zeus went from being the uh, son, S-U-N-S-O-N of God of Kronos, to becoming the potter himself, the father. So in that role as the first person of the Trinity now, he is both a man and a maid. He's the androgyne. Venus, Urania, Hermaphrodite, all the different versions of this. And so whenever we find out that Hera is the trickster who curses Callisto after he impregnates her, I believe that Zeus, Hera in this story are the male-female aspects of Janus or Brahm or whatever version, the first person of the Trinity that we're seeing represented by Zeus. Then you have Callisto, who is the uh destroyer regenerator that is an, its own person in the trinity and i believe this story is allegorizing how it is uh easy to mistake the regenerator for the destroyer and not realize that it's a good aspect of nature totally you see the bear and you're like oh my god it's a bear <laughs> and her son was going to slay her very much like what has happened in my in for a long ass time where the modern, uh, for example, Christian thinkers have separated Satan from Eve or the serpent from Eve. They're the same being. Whenever you get into the origins of it, <clears throat> they're the same thing. And uh, the destruction aspect is important for the regeneration. The ancients never could observe many matter actually ceasing to exist or being annihilated. Part of the reason why they had the eternality of matter as part of their doctrine before that all got confused again to go back to that subject and something comes from nothing now. All of these changes to, in my opinion, to the whole system are from misunderstanding the Trinity and misunderstanding and separating the destroyer regenerator from each other and mm. creating a holy ghost, a mother Mary and a Satan. And now, oddly enough, that actually brings your three into kind of a four. 
And at the same time that this was going on is not that far off from when it changed from being a three season calendar to a four season calendar. Oddly enough, I don't know what to make of that uh, other than it's interesting. So I think that the son of Zeus and Callisto is the preserver or savior uh, son of God aspect. And then (laughs) to talk about Canis major a little bit and Canis minor, it's interesting how they have seven stars, right? And the other one that circumnavigates the pole, Draco, having 15 stars. Mm. When you put those together, um, Ursa Major and Draco being the ones that are further out, that actually yeah. equals up to 22 stars. Ooh. And then Ursa Minor was seven stars. And if you do 22 that. divided by seven... That is the closest fraction or division that you can do with whole numbers that approximates pi. Mm. And they're going in this circle around the pole, a very evident circle. So I think I covered off everything that came to mind from your <laughs> what you were talking about. I did my best. <laughs> oh, dude, that's great, man. I love it. I'm so glad we're uh, doing this together, honestly. So, I mean, dude, you're giving me all sorts of notes, man. Uh, things to follow up with and shit like that. So you are appreciated. Um, so, you know... When we talk about the pole star, to me, now when I look at this illustration, that's what gives everything uh, a harmonious rhythm. It gives everything a purpose. It gives everything to revolve around. You know, it is the structure or the order that this system needs, which is why that small illustration with the cave, with uh, what arguably, in my opinion, could be the pole star. It's the most white that you will see in that entire illustration, you know? And so to me, that's very significant. And once again, the seven rays, the seven points of the star, the bear, the, the all of the seven stars combined, this is a polar reference, you know, because this is what is needed to make this whole entire system go. It's something for everything to revolve around. This is the symbolic, in my opinion, hub of the wheel in this chaos illustration but it's not central just like everything else is kind of you know just scattered about and so that's the takeaway that i get personally from this illustration um and so if you have more thoughts go for it but uh feel free just makes me think of polarity as a concept you know yeah polarity pole exactly paul paul is wisdom and it's the gate and ari is what, like we said, bear, lion, river, all these words, and north. <laughs> and then T is the Tav, the T, the terminus point, because this is the point where the mo- motion terminates. It's the alpha and the omega. It's the beginning and the end. You know, even the uh, idea of the mark of the beast comes from the Mithraic cults and previous times earlier, whenever the emblem of the sun and the number 10, whether it was in the, uh, uh, the Yod, the X, or the T, would be marked on the forehead of the followers. And this Mm. was said to spare you from the wrath of chaos. Wow. AKA the wrath of the sun during winter, because the winter side of the Zodiac is also the chaos side. Sure. So there's a lot to that. So polarity, (laughs) polarity. Yeah. You know, it's like the gate or the wisdom of the bear or of the river. Wow. Of T, of 10, of, of, uh, Dees. God. Nice. And that's yeah, where dude. things, that's the generative it. principle comes from polarity. Right. Exactly. Right. For sure. Awesome, dude. That was fantastic. So, um, continuing on, we have, I wrote there the pole star, right? Showing you a quick, uh, sky map of what that looks like. And so, and then if we move forward, I believe it's some information about, uh, the pole. Oh no, it's not, but it's perfect. (laughs) So I put these slides in such a way that it would make sense. And I didn't know that this was the next one, but this is awesome. Okay. So some illustrations of chaos, what they show the post chaotic sort of uh, thing that they illustrate is this kinder nature, this godlike figure that separates things and so what you have here is a uh, symbolic of a of a god of god the one separating things so he's separating you know what looks like the night side and the day side and what i'm learning about symbolism is that 
um, orientation doesn't matter as much as I thought it used to matter. So whenever I conceived of, of the pole in my mind, I always thought about it being vertical. It doesn't matter if it's vertical, if it's, you know, tilted or if it's horizontal, it's all the same thing. In my opinion, yes, you can infer different information when you draw a vertical line versus a horizontal line. But when you really, really get down to it, symbolically, these things are the same, uh, whether they're orientated this way or that way or whatever. So this is God separating things. So what, you know, this was mentioned earlier on is that a kinder nature untangled the chaos, separated the chaos from each other. And so this is a visual representation of God, the one doing just that. So if you proceed, there's there's more versions of this illustration. I think I have like three or four in a row. Uh, where does this illustration come from? This one specifically, I'm not sure, but they're they're all related to this first book of of chaos and the beginning of creation. Okay, cool. Um, a couple of things here that I just want to throw out there. There's a stork next to him. Yes, stork is interesting because that was a nickname for the Pelasgi or the Phoenician adventurer sailor class who may very well have been the ones that spread at least the most modern version of this Zodiac and this uh, sky clock around the world. <laughs> they were the storks. So interesting that that's, you know, right next to him. I don't know. That I could thought be so too, Thoth. Actually. I mean, that could be Thoth, basically, exactly. the, the Ibis. Ibis. He's yeah. the one that brings the language. Well, that's what the storks were doing. They're bringing the language of the Zodiac and literal languages around the world. I mean... Uh, ancient Hebrew, ancient Greek, ancient Celtic all have the same first 16 letters as the Phoenician 16 original letters. Something's up with that. And uh, I could go on, but he's to the right. If you look at where the right hand is of the potter, the father who has the solar crown on with the rays even, mm -hmm. uh, and he's in the cloud, he's on a cloud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the sun is his emblem. He isn't the sun literally because you see the sun back there. But the sun is his chief representative because it's bringing the light, which is order to the world. But yeah. it's to his right. I mean, if you were right. oriented, orienting yourself as he's standing to the right hand of him would be this stork, who, which is the uh, second person of the Trinity, the mediator, who is the one who gives the language, who is Thoth, Tot, Odin, Mercury, you name it. So I just thought that was interesting. A little stuff, subtle dude. nod to his son at his right hand there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nah, man, I'm into it. It's so cool to have fresh eyes on this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so happy you did this for my channel, dude. I'm having a blast. I appreciate you. Nice, nice. It's a really good slideshow. Cool, cool. So here's another example. You know, different interpretation of things. But once again, this separation is the thing, right? So sometimes people say it's like, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Right. And so if you're going to break up a fight, you're going to put your arms between two people. So this concept of separation is the main thing that I want to get across is that it's the separation that brought order. And so I would say by extension, it's the pole that is bringing order. It's the separation of the heavens and the earth that brings order because everything beforehand, according to this way of looking at everything, and I'm not saying that this is even what I subscribe to. I'm just trying to syncretize things and see, you know, what makes the most sense. But if everything was homogenized and together, we needed this separation to occur in order for everything to have their own space to do their thing. So this is just another example of that artwork. Yeah, dude, that's why wisdom, pole, pala, pula, gates, all these things are synonymous terms gates your gate gating something is separating one side from another side gatekeeping right yeah yeah and the mouth is one of the major major gates which is probably why the ads tool in the ancient egyptian ceremony looks like a seven yes, and dude. is the opening of the mouth which is you know you're helping the person on the gate going through the gate between realms of uh you know one life to the next there's so many so many yeah. ways that what you said makes sense. And also the last thing to add is how when the polarization happens, there's a pull that happens. Mm. Yes, dude. Exactly. Things that, yeah, yeah. Think you, of you how totally the, compass, the compass pulls to the pole towards yeah. the north, right? Yep, dude. You got it, man. 
This is awesome. So I think there's maybe uh, one or two more other images like this. Just variations on the theme. So feel free and proceed. Another one kind of showing the separation in a different way. I think it's interesting, the the hand gestures uh, for each one, but the same general idea, you know, of there being this separation occurring. And uh, the first time I see Cheney pop into the chat, we see two bunny rabbits here at the bottom. So that's yeah, of course. <laughs> What's up, Cheney? <laughs> Dude, she was on fire last night. It was awesome. Oh, man, yeah, I wish I was here. at the weave, but I needed sleep. I wanted to oh, be yeah, real yeah. fresh and bright for tonight. And, uh, and turned I out pretty good. I got some good sleep. Nice, <laughs> I nice. missed you guys, awesome. though. I saw the missing persons post yeah. you made for me. That was <laughs> fucking funny. Yeah, that's perfect, man. <laughs> Thanks for making a guy feel wanted. Love you guys. Sp weaving spiders webs on YouTube. Everyone go check it out. That's right. Yeah, we don't have to. We could analyze this image and yeah. the others that you have here, like as long as the chaos picture. So I won't believe totally. It. So here's one other example. And here up top, you can say, uh, see Ovid Metam. So I'm assuming this is obviously Ovid Metamorphosis reference, right? But I love this version because it really shows the untangling aspect of what um, I'm referring to. So God untangling the elements, right? Separating the elements from each other. And then notice that he's doing kind of the classic as above, so below sort of position which a lot of people are familiar with and can be seen in all sorts of different places or whatever. But to me, I really love this one for the untangling aspect, right? And so uh, feel free and comment, uh, but the next slide is a reference to the untangling as well. It's interesting because it's like, that's like what we're doing here. We're yes, looking right? for the pattern, which is the potter, which is the father, uh, the father being the androgyne, technically it's neuter. Mm -hmm. It's the original cause, but I agree, you know, that, um actually <laughs> the being that you see doing this work here this is not the potter or the father technically it uh it gets confused i think in um different well it depends on whose art it is or whose symbolism it is but i think the original version original idea would be it is the second person or the psychopomp the yes. mediator who does this job dude you and got it, do man. it through he does it through language it's the logos it's the word he's like this is that, and that's that. He's naming it, gating them off, using his mouth for to to speak the wisdom, <laughs> you know, at the head or the beginning of all things. He's the RK. Uh, there's so many things, but Her uh, Heron. I want to return to the idea of the Heron that was a few slides back because Cheney was making comments about it, and it just struck me that as a symbol, Heron, Stork, um, Ibis, what have you, they're all very similar types of birds. Fascinating that that ends up being a symbol of the mediator because the word heri like h-e-r-i in sanskrit the ancient sanskrit means savior that's where the heri krishna comes from yeah. Hari krishna which Dude. is also Hari is the hr that probably is original like similar to the uh hrs of words that give us horus and and all that so there's a lot there a uh, little side weave Dude, brilliant, man. I'm so into it, man. This is so great, honestly, because you're you're uh, talking about things that I'm building up to, and I agree <laughs> with you wholeheartedly. So you see it cool. coming, you know, because yeah. you understand the symbolism and everything. So that's awesome. Um, and then Our also my last is so, name. so uh, synced up with each other, dude. It's awesome. It's true. It's true. Uh, my last name, right, is Garza, which means heron. And so when you look what? at um, like... Um, Did not know that, dude. Yeah, uh, like Mexican bingo, basically. Uh, you know, La Garza, is, it shows a heron, essentially. So anyways, that's cool that you threw all that down. But you're totally right. The psychopomp thing, I agree with you. Long story short. Um, so the untangling thing is the main reason why I put this here. Plus, it's just badass artwork. But if it you proceed to the artwork. next slide, yeah, dude, you're I think the, that you'll find this interesting, too. You're the mediator, dude. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> so... I've Classic used this right image, yeah, in several videos as of late. And this is the Weeping Virgin. So this is a Masonic work of art. And I just think it's really interesting because up until recently, like this week, as I'm preparing for all this stuff, I had a different interpretation of the untangling of the hair. But now that I'm aware of this separation, um, this polar separation, I'm wondering if that's what's really going on here, if that's what it's alluding to. Right. And so notice that there's a broken pillar 
similarly to the chaos image of there being uh, broken aspects of the uh, the zodiac wheel and everything else. Everything's out of sorts. So you have this chaos image with the pillar. You've got the virgin, the maiden, and then um, Chrono Saturn, Father Time, is untangling her hair because I think that this is his role. This is how he brings order to things is by untangling things and separating the elements. So I think that all of the symbolism is kind of here, but just set up in a different way. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. No, I, I love uh, your entire explanation of all that. Um, what's interesting is that while the untangling is happening, she's looking at the Torah or the book or the law. Yeah. Right. So the idea of the word and the untangling are being combined here that as she's taking in the nice. words uh, to her psyche through her third eye, her physical form is getting untangled as well. Her hair, her hairy, <laughs> the savior that's a part of her <laughs> is be being formed. I don't know. That might be a bit of a stretch, but I'm still really thinking about the hairy thing. And now that I realize Heron connects to it. And then I was thinking Mercury, who is a, you know, one of these saviors, one way of saying Mercury would be Mer Harry, Mer Harry. Like if mm. you, you know, C is interchangeable with X and CH in all languages. And depending on who said it, they might really say a Harry in there with Mercury. <laughs> it's wild. Right. It just goes on and on. It does. It does. So I thought that was worth putting in here. And um, I can't recall what the next slide is, but I'm sure it makes sense <laughs> because I went over this thing many times. Yeah. The only way you grow hair is time. That's mm. true. Nice. But I've been really on a kick lately de describing how uh, time, it, the, the Greeks actually had two words for time. And we have four, we have four Greek words for love, for example, and we only have one word in English, love. And in the same way, the Greeks had chronos, which was your measured time. And then they had curios, curios, which sounds like curious, oddly enough. And that's subjective time, totally different. And I've explained this a lot lately, but just in like a little short refresher, think of the difference between uh, the rhythms of the sky clock, which seem to be about the same time every time, like 28-ish days for the moon, 365.25 for the sun. I think that there's wobble. I don't think it's, I don't think Kronos exists <laughs> in a factual, actual way where it's consistently the same every time. I think the best we do is averages and nature wiggles, but think of uh, seasons and how a frost might be at a different time every year, the last frost or where, when things sprout and generate germinate out of the ground might be at a different time, roughly close, but there's a subjectivity to nature's version of time. And then there's our numerical measured time. Right. And the Greeks had both versions and we in English just have the word time. Mm. And I think it's part of our whole inversion confusion is that <laughs> we're mistaking the map for the terrain. We're mistaking the, uh, the, the description for the feeling in almost every possible way we can. We're putting, <laughs> we're putting the word before the matter. <laughs> You know, in a mm. sense, you know, uh, yeah. that's, I think, the big part of the inversion in general that humanity needs to rearrange for themselves to put consciousness before expression rather than waiting for expression to dictate our consciousness. There you go. There you go. I totally agree. Yeah, well put, too. Nice. So uh, I think the next slide is about the Axis Mundi. And so essentially, you know, the Axis Mundi, this symbolic pole that reaches from earth to the heavens it's the symbolic separation and connection between the earth and the heavens and so that is like the main point that i'm trying to get at here is that that's what the axis mundi symbolically represents um i always used to think about it in terms of connection you know like it's a bridge to the other side you know it's the uh, trunk of the world tree or what have you but now i'm really starting to realize and see that actually it functions almost like um like a tent pole or something that there's this separation here. And actually there's some groups that use a tent in their ritual workings and the central pole in the tent literally is the axis Mundi. They acknowledge it as the axis Mundi as this Northern pole. And so I think that's really interesting. So this idea of the axis Mundi serves both of these purposes, separation and connection. Yeah. And uh, the phallic nature of that. Yep. Uh, in the metaphor 
I think is probably why the father or the potter is considered to be the one that does the separating. That's right. Exactly. Because you need that pole to have the pole to have the, the gate, <laughs> you know, yeah. all of that. And then mm, it also uh, just makes me think of that guy, Shu, <laughs> the Egyptian uh, God, Shu, who is the one that separated his children who were the sky and the earth so that there could be a material creation. And that is a fascinating word. Always a lot to think about that the God that did the separating to the Egyptians was Shu, you mm-hmm. know, in the old English, like in Higgins here, not even that long ago, when he they say sheweth rather than show, like I'm going to show you something, I sheweth it to you, <laughs> mm. you know, so shu without shu during the separation, there'd be nothing for us to be shoon, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it would all <laughs> yeah, just yeah, be exactly. dark and smashed together, you know, there's That's a right. lot there. Yeah, yeah, you got it. So uh, the next slide here has to do with, you know, in my opinion, the other references, just some of the other references that I think are expressions of this Axis Mundi. You've got the Axis Mundi itself. You clearly got the pole. Uh, and then with pole, I always think of hole. There's generally uh, a correspondence there where there's a pole, there's a hole, or they will seek each other sort of thing. Um, there's also this concept of the column or the pillar, the post. You know, uh, this is why I think we get, uh, we refer to it as the post office and postage, you know, um, because Mercury goes up and down the post, you know, and he's the messenger of the gods, right? Uh, this axis mundi is also the world tree. It's the trunk of the world tree. It's what bridges and separates the heavens and earth. Uh, That's why a lot of these uh, saviors also get nailed to the post. Yes, dude. Exactly right. 100%. Yep. Uh, So as we said, the phallus, right? That's pretty obvious. Makes a lot of sense. The leg and one leggedness is something that is really fascinating to me. There's different myths about, you know, um, a deity losing like a foot or only having one leg to stand on, whatever. Uh, There's stuff going on there with the northern sky and one legs. So talking about uh, Rex Rex Mundi, who is the king of this axis, you know, Uh, Mm -hmm. the Demiurgos, which is actually Mercury. (laughs) Pata, yes, exactly. etc. Yeah. Uh leg, do the LR switch. What is leg? It's reg. Like Ooh. regs, mundi, reg, yeah. regulus, the regal, you know, legal and regal. There's a reason why those words go Ooh. together. <laughs> the, That's the regality a good one. makes the legality. So when we're looking at the word leg, it's not a coincidence why leg is the word that it is and that it has this pole uh symbolism to it. Leg and yeah. rag. That's dope, dude. I love that. There's another one in here too. Lingam you could put on this list. Yes, 100%. Yep, that's a good one. That's a really good one, actually. Um, the staff is also another example. The obelisk, the tower, you know, um, the tower of Babel, uh, the sword, the spear. Uh, I would say it's the bridge as well. You know, it's a stairway, the stairway to heaven. I think that's what we're referring to when we talk about the axis mundi it's a stairway to heaven i think that's what is being referenced when people talk about going to the other side it's this northern um thing and then also ladder too i think is also an appropriate expression for this so and like i said there's more um but these are the ones that i felt like were worth highlighting and notice that there's this theme obviously they're all phallic they're all long but the idea is still the same separation and connection love it dude yeah, nice. the the last little word thing that pops to mind is how uh, ladder is la adder, the adder, which is a serpent. Interesting. Ah, hell yeah, dude. And, or el yeah, adder the serpent would be symbolism like, you know, with the, north. the god serpent, the god snake. Nice. nice. Sarah piece. Cool. All right. So it's interesting because there's several myths out there about a chaotic a uh, monster or dragon that is Chimera. essentially cut in half. And in this example, this is Tiamat. So she is this chaotic monster. She's cut in half. And uh, I believe she's cut in half with wind, actually, which goes back to the word and air symbolism and everything else. But she's cut in half and we exist within her. That's the mythology is that Tiamat was separated and we live within her body essentially. And so to me, this just speaks to everything that I'm talking about. 
is that everything was this homogenized chaos, according to Ovid and, you know, this first poem. And then there was a separation that occurred. And the separation that occurred came via a masculine patriarchal entity of some kind, you know, or uh, one of their tools, a sword or a spear or what have you. So this is the story of Tiamat. And so if you progress to the next slide, unless you have something to say. No, just that uh, lately what I've been thinking about Tiamat is that it's the time of Met. Ah. The Tim, Tim and Met, <laughs> like, mm. uh, you know, Met being wisdom as well. So that's uh, uh, giving you the sort of mother. Sophia is also her son. Uh, yes. And her, she's, she is her son and her son is her husband. That's the three in one thing. Tiamat, I think, symbolizes a, a, a one that becomes three and the three that, and then the three becomes one again, goes on. Totally. And the thing I just want to point out too is that uh, she is the mother of monstrosities. And so it's one of her children that separates her, a, chi uh, a child of a child, I believe, Marduk. And so notice that there's the instruments to get that done that uh, he's holding on the right here. There's a sword and, you know, sharp objects and implements and stuff to separate her, to cut her in half so that we can dwell within her. Yeah. Mar being the same as uh, Mars, being the same as uh, Rama backwards. Uh, you have a lot of correlation to the story of Zeus or Jupiter with Marduk. It could go on and on with that, actually. So, yeah. Uh, demonstrates again that if Tiamat in one mythology is the mother of monsters, well, Kronos or, or Saturn being the one who is uh, castrated by Zeus and that that generates uh, the conditions for the world that we currently live in. It's just demonstrating that this mother of monsters is more hermaphroditic than, uh, you know, actually just a female. That's and right. that confusion of the nature of the Trinity, again, is where we get whack doctrines that like females are evil because <laughs> somebody misunderstood the destroyer regenerator aspect of the Trinity or you right. know, serpents yeah, are the yeah, devil yeah. and all that. Yep. Yep. No, you got it, man. So um, there's variations on this theme uh, with the symbolism. So. If you progress to the next slide, you'll see another image. As you can tell, I'm a very visual person. It's great that this is kind of what's going on because I'm so visual. I bring these images to the table and then you're really into the phonetics and etymology of everything. So you're bringing that to the table too. So I think that's really great that uh, this yeah, is all coming together. Back to the titty dragon that we saw way at the beginning. That's <laughs> yes. what I was alluding it. to is the destroyer regenerator aspect being one. That's why you have breasts on the dragon. Yep. You got it, man. Um, so there are, you know, several stories out there about a chaotic dragon or monster being slain, slaying the dragon actually is like a whole rabbit hole that people can go down mythologically. There's like so many different examples of this, right? Um, but what I think is really fascinating, at least when you look at visual representations of this dragon being slain, you oftentimes see a spear or a pole. So this is getting to everything that I'm talking about. It's this chaos being separated via the pole, this chaos being slain with a pole. You know, that's how I interpret it at least. And so to me, it's fascinating that so many of these spears or poles are very, very emphasized, you know? And so I think it makes a lot of sense given everything that we've gone over that this would be the case. Interesting that uh, in the chat, Cody is mentioning that T, as in Tiamat, could mean arrow or spear in Proto-Indo-European. Mm. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, it just adds to all this stuff. And of course, in Tiamat, you have the idea of Ma'at. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And so we'll see another example in the next slide of pretty That's much... Really Really good artwork here. <laughs> Similar artwork. Um, you know, but this time it's a seven headed beast, which I think is interesting. There's the seven again and it's the cross, right? And then it's this long penetrative uh, spear, you know? And so again, it's this pole that brings order essentially is what I'm getting at. And this time it's got a cross on it. Yep. 
Yeah, it's absolutely. literally a crucifix on it. <laughs> yeah, you'll see and, that a lot. Uh, they're inside a very vesica type shape, and then Christ has the glory, and he's yeah. got a bride. Oh man, there's a lot of heresy in this particular artwork to the modern <laughs> church. <laughs> yeah. Totally, totally. This is a lot of times you'll see this. This is great. Uh, yeah, man. I don't know. Uh, Google, I'm sure, but uh, there's a lot Save of versions where stuff, it's... man, you never know when all of a sudden you're never going to be able to find this online again. Oh, it's true. Oh, yeah, it's all backed up and everything okay. else. Uh, but right, you'll good. see a lot of times When's like the Virgin Mary. Coming? What was that? When's your first book coming? Oh, I know. Have these images yeah, yeah, in yeah. it. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Um, so sometimes you'll see the Virgin Mary holding Christ, and they together are slaying chaos with this very long pole. And oftentimes um, it does have the cross at the very end of it. Um, and so that gets across all the things that I'm trying to talk about. And then uh, let's see what's going on here. with Oh, the next it gets slide. them across. I see what you did there. <laughs> okay. So this is like an example, right? Of a, a visual, like pictographic representation of, you know, uh, chaos if it were ordered, right? So here you see the four winds in the corners. And then within that, uh, you will see the 12 houses. And then within that, you'll see the 12 signs. And then within that, you will see uh, the seven traditional planets. And then within that, you'll actually see Earth. So this is like a geocentric, in my opinion. Well, it depends on how you look at it, but Earth is in the center, essentially. And so again, the pole this axis mundi, the pole star, it's this hub of a great wheel. And so traditionally, you would see the four winds in the corners as such. And everything is nice and organized and everything has a place. So everything is orderly, essentially. But it's because of the pole. It's because of the central pole that allows space for everything to do its thing, which is why there's order and why things are able to be untangled. I I could get lost in this one. Should we move on? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. There, uh, this could be like each of these squares could be a a card in like a, a heady tarot deck or something. Oh yeah, dude, for sure. Some of it actually is reminiscent to the tarot. Like um, this could be the emperor, you know, yeah. and the death, and but then others, I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I know I haven't I even some started socks decoding some this one. Beat there, and it's twelve. So I'm guessing this is Piscean in some way, uh, but. You know, very bizarre, very mm -hmm, bizarre. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. It's almost sure. like showing how the the scenes of daily life are actually on the outer edge, like furthest from the source, mm. in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Yet Earth is also depicted in the center. There's a lot of paradoxes about this uh, that I like. Nice, nice. Okay. So this is your next slide. So what I'm trying to say, you know, I've said this before, but uh, I think it might be more accurate to say that we live in a polar system over a solar system. And so the pole is what brings order. The pole is what the heavens revolve around. The pole, this axis moony concept, the pole star, everything else, it really is super significant. So I think it's very fascinating that polar and solar are just a one letter switch. And so I just thought I would mention that before, you know, I forget or whatever. <laughs> no, so that's, these are... and I think it's super important, man. And guess what? Poe. Go for it. Poe is one of the ancient names of Buddha. Mm. He has many names, but yeah, definitely nice. is one of the names of Buddha. Important that's really one. interesting. And so um, it seems, I think we both are in agreement that uh, when you get into studying esoteric symbolism, First, you start seeing the solar encoding of everything. Mm -hmm. Then you try to go further, trace the origins, and you're like, oh, shit, there's a layer underneath this that's more occult and more hidden, which is the polar. <laughs> so in the ancient world, I don't think that they depicted, I'm pretty sure the reason why you had this mediator who was the son or son of God uh, was because the original prime cause or source was the invisible, unmovable, un kind of unknowable, and it wouldn't be depicted in imagery. Like you made no images mm. of the father or the potter or the mm. monad didn't exist. It's also chaos in a way, mm. in a way it's yeah, both. Totally. And, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so in the same way, it's like the polar aspect of symbolism is hidden or occulted. They don't really show it to you, but it's there to find if you start to see the pattern, the potter, which would be the, uh, the pal palace pole, the wisdom, the mother, father, that is the origin, the emperor, uh, 
amphro, I'm sorry, <laughs> hermaphroditic uh, mm. origin or source. That's totally. my two cents on it. I think that yeah. it's well, probably no, the, the, the hermaphroditic the thing is going to be. God. Yeah, no, the hermaphroditic thing is on point. And actually, uh, it kind of is a part of the last few slides here. And so I think it kind of wraps up uh, some of that symbolism. And Snake Jones in the house, he's absolutely right. Up, you got to get some sunlight on your junk. <laughs> it's true. It will cure you nice. of weakness. <laughs> right, right. Lamato, the fool. So, you know, thinking about this symbolism, thinking about the pole separating, thinking about chaos, I was immediately reminded of the fool card and another card in the thought deck. And so the fool, in many ways, I think is supposed to be symbolic of chaos. You know, it's number zero. So it's kind of nothing and everything at the same time. I guess you could argue. Um, notice how chaotic everything seemingly is within this image as well. You don't know if he's standing. You don't know if he's falling. You don't know if it's a man. You don't know if it's a woman. Um, there are a lot of things kind of going on here that uh, give this energy um, that is kind of chaotic and isn't exactly orderly, right? And so it's fascinating that this is number zero and the full represents kind of this raw energy as well. It's the beginning of the whole entire major arcana, you know? So as chaos, or seemingly- the Or the end, right. Well, same thing with chaos, you know? And so according to the way Ovid presented everything, chaos was the beginning of everything. And there are thoughts that, you know, basically there's philosophies that we go from chaos to order back to chaos again. And that this is just the sine wave or frequency of things, you know. And Ovid um, is void. It's a monogram or an anagram for void. And the void is the chaos. Ooh, nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like that. I hadn't thought about that. Um, so to me, it's fascinating that there is this energy tied to the fool card. And then when you look at the next card, which is the next slide we have the magician card, which is number one, number one, Roman numeral one. This is the pole and notice the pole right behind him, right? This card is associated with Mercury. He's the psychopomp. He goes up and down the world tree. He goes up and down the pillar or the post, right? And notice that there is a very obvious visual separation going on. It's because this pole brings separation. Also notice that he's doing the classic as above, so below gesture in a way that's kind of not unlike these uh, figures and the illustrations that I was showing earlier. It's the one that separates. And so now the elements are separated and there's a separation between heaven and earth. And so it almost looks like two planes that are being separated too in the background. Yeah, and if you look at the symbol above his head, it actually looks kind of like a plane <laughs> and the little symbol in the circle, oddly enough. Like a plane yeah. as in like an airplane, which is totally. a little early for Crowley. But uh, and to what go I back to the, the chaos of this, I do think this is the primordial chaos. I think that's a great, um, a great layer of the symbolism here. I mean, you have the Tiamat <laughs> uh, in a yes, way. Exactly, 100%. That's it. The tiger, <laughs> tiger, yeah, which is you know also very like lion symbolism, Ari, uh, river, the flow, just the natural flow of nature. And anyway, in his bag, you have all these seemingly zodiacal symbols and planetary symbols. Yeah, and it's like they're all jumbled together in a bag and not, you know, separate or in order. They're chaotically just thrown in the bag and thus in darkness, obscured, not you know doing their normal thing it's before that they haven't been set into place yet yep you got it man exactly and then the dove um so the dove whenever you see the dove symbolism it's encoding uh two things majorly secret encoding are the yoni and blackness are both encoded in the dove mm. uh I could, if you want to elaborate on that, that's fine. I have else at other times, or you can just take my word for it. <laughs> but no, no, you know, already as you're chaos, saying that connections are starting to are, click. Are, yeah, yeah, you see why that would pertain to chaos. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, for sure. Nice, dude. That's awesome. And then notice too, it looks like there's a caduceus 
too, right? Uh, the the twin serpents and the um, winged disc, which I think arguably the disc in the middle could be a uh, a reference to the pole star, and but it's tilted, it's off. You know what I mean? It's not even pointed up and down. Versus in the next card, you kind of have a similar metaphor up top, but it's upright with the pole symbolically. Mm. And uh, the vibe that I kind of get from this card now is that everything is ascending up the pole. You know, now that there is this separation, there's a place to go, you know, so it's almost like all of the elements are floating. It's almost like he's going up the world tree or the yeah, there's a pillar. pole, a pole there's to the throne, pole. to the north, to the, pole. the ladder stairway to heaven. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and then the next card or the next slide is uh, the world tree. And so I just wanted to reemphasize this concept of the world tree. It connects the heavens and it connects earth but it also separates the heavens and separates earth. That is like my main point that I'm getting across here with everything. And then I just have some quick text here in the last slide, which that is the last slide. This is the last one right here. So, you know, a lot of people throw around as above, so below for good reason. You know, it's a very powerful uh, thing to acknowledge. Um, but, you know, the thing that I'm just kind of like thinking about now is, you know, this is another version of the uh, the magician card, right? He's typically this is the Rider weight version. He's typically doing the arm gesture. He has an actual wand or phallus or pole in his hand. But you know, when I see this gesture now, after doing some of this research, it's as above, so below. But what I really take away from it is what I wrote here. It's the one that separates the above with the with the below. That's the one. And that's what he's representing here. And if you were to make that gesture or embody this sort of thing, you would be the one that separates the above with the below and the one that connects the above with the below. So once again, just further reemphasizing this connection, this separation. And I think that that is partly what's being encoded in this card, the magician. Symbolically, he is like this uh, godlike figure that is acknowledging the separation and the connection with the heavens uh, and with earth. Oh, man. So that's what I got for you, man. Oh, so I just had brain explosions about as above, so below that I've never had. <laughs> okay. Nice. Okay. Nice. So this conversation is great because it really has helped me conceptualize and maybe others too have listened. I don't know, but for me, I've really, it's really helped me click the whole notion of, the mediator is also the demiurgos, the craftsman, right? <laughs> and that might not be, an, you know, that might not be an easy thing to comprehend, but there's like an esoteric philosophical, there's a logic to it, actually. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> the mediator is connecting the above and the below, but mm -hmm. also that's creating all the space for the physical world. You know, it, it goes on, but... Let's look at as above, so below through green language lens. I'm not saying that this was ever intended by the language or whatever, but I do think the logos comes through our language in ways that are beyond human attention. And that's part of the, the mystery of the word being <laughs> so mystical. But um, okay, there's, la there's layers to this, all right? So as above has Asa, A-S-A, which means Lord. It has ab, which is ab ab, which is father, and it has ov, which is basically yov. So it has asa, which is what they would call Thor, asa Thor. Also, asa would be involved in some of the names for Buddha. Thor is one of the mediator, savior, demure ghost characters. I know that's not like the Thor that's in the Marvel movies or in. <laughs> The poetic Edda's even, <laughs> but follow me here. Uh, Edda is Veda without the aspirate. Edda's, Veda's, if you do the V to B switch, like between Latin and Sanskrit, the Vedas are the Betas. And in philology, you can swap any vowel sound for any vowel sound because dialects of different people who speak the same language do that very thing. So the Vedas to the V to the B, the Betas, the Buddhas, you drop the mm. aspirate, it's the Eddas, the poetic Eddas. Mm. We're all we're talking about the 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 bud, <laughs> the the thing that grows off of the tree, which is the trunk, which is the pole. What's the first thing that grows off of it? Is the bud, the first, you know, the, the son of God, Adonis, who is a seed off the tree, Kronos corn, yada yada yada. So Asa, Lord, 
Ab, father, ov, yov, <laughs> uh, even could get to of from that if you really wanted to, like ofus. And then so below makes me think, you know, almost giving me like the Sobek, Tiamat, uh, Crocodile mm. Monster vibe. But most importantly, Bell, El to R is bear. Bell is the the sun as emblem, emblem, the emblem of the sun as the bull, Bell, which is the female, the Taurus, the Tar. So mm. uh, Bell <laughs> is in there. And then O or uh, Ow. Again, in the Sanskrit to Latin switch, and also in, I think, other languages too, W's become M's. So that's why you have Mercury selling wares, Wary, Mary, War, Mar. All of these things are from this weird W becoming M thing that Latin and Sanskrit switch between. So, Bello is also got Om encoded in it. Bell, Om. Mm. Uh, so the father, the father that's as above could be the pole and the, that's it, so, dude. and the, so below is the solar, you know, mm. the sun, the generative aspect of the sun or the sun moon system. You could even look at it like that. So all of that's going on. And then even bellow <laughs> bellows are what the craftsman who is the car, um, the sun in his chariot, you know, the, the, so below is the mediator. Uh, for the as above in in another aspect or metric of this division. So the son of God, the son of the Asa, yo, possibly. I know I'm just spitballing a lot of wild associations here, but the bellows are what the craftsman uses, the smith uses, Vulcan uses a bellows in the crafting too. So like just in as above, so below, there's all these crazy totally. elements of the language of oh, yeah in it. I'm here for it, man. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, so I mean that's the slideshow. That's the slideshow, dude. I mean, there's more to unpack from here, but I think I kind of, you know, laid things out, you know, hopefully in a way that people understand and uh, get it sounds I mean, you're getting it, dude. I mean, you got it, you know, with so many things. So it's freaking awesome. This was perfect. You're getting so, uh, it. Takes me to no one. I'm really so, interested yeah. in um, going further with maybe images from this book or analyzing the metamorphosis with you. You know, if you want to do more either with the, the four horsemen and a vibrant or do another interverse, I'm anytime. I know that the crew couldn't really get tired of this particular type of gravy. It's sort of like probably why a lot of you are here. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, exactly the most right. fun stuff for me too. And um, you know, one thing, the only dangling chat I got left is on Prometheus who oh, is uh it. one of the first versions of this um craftsman demiurgos mediator character is the second person in the trinity so um you have anything you want i'm going to find the prometheus slide but do you have anything uh you know to say about prometheus since we did leave that a bit on the table from the beginning when you had a slide of him you know, off the top of my head, not really. I do think it's really interesting, though. Uh, last night on Weaving Spiders, the conversation was brought up, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of already, but that Benjamin Franklin is encoding a modern day Promethean storyline. And so it, it appears as though, uh, you know, he in some ways is a mythological figure and that there's a lot of overlapping symbolism with Prometheus and what he's acknowledged uh, for doing with electricity and things like that, fire from the gods, et cetera. So um, I'm not sure if I feel like unpacking all of that right now, but that's uh, on the top of my head, just kind of like what comes to mind because it was brought up last night. And I think that's really, really fascinating, uh, but feel free and riff away, dude. Yeah. I, I won't go super far into Prometheus, but there's some, some things there that I picked up from Dylan's book, um, God's Acre for Winds of the Soul, book four. Some observations he made philologically about Prometheus that are interesting. And um, it's got the word Prometheus has Roma in it. <laughs> Proma, Prometheus, Roma, whatever. Uh, that's fascinating. And then um, there's also in Sanskrit, in uh, Hinduism, there is, I'm trying to find the exact quote. Sorry. It's right here. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, yeah. Prama, Pramath Pati, the Lord or Father of the Pramathas. So the Pramathas are a thing in Hinduism. I'm, I won't go into, but just interesting to point out that 
Prometheus sounds a lot like uh, <laughs> Pramathas and Pramath Pati, Lord or Father of Pati. We even have Pati, Patir, Jupiter, Pater, all that. There's so much, you know, Latin, to, Latin and Sanskrit, ancient Sanskrit are so similar that it's astronomically improbable that they are from the same thing. And then um, if you drop the aspirate in Prometheus, you would have Ruma Theos. Ruma is a word referring to strong. It's where we get it's Roma, Ruma, same thing, for, uh, which is interesting because uh, <laughs> like Kronos or the strong hunter, there's the god of fortresses, Fortis is strong. Uh, there's a lot of versions of the, the strong or the mighty one, Orion, et cetera, Hercules. Um, and then you have, <laughs> oh man, then we, someday we need to talk about Eros, dude. There's that too. Mm. But uh, if you do the interchangeability of P to B, because that's a switch that happens as well, P's become B's, then Prometheus could be Brahma Theos or mm. Brahm, Brahma Theos. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. a, there's that too. So it goes gotcha. on. Like when you just start doing the little, the little things, you know, the keys to how languages shift between dialects and between languages, the way letters shift and, and all that, all of a sudden these systems become way more similar all of a sudden. Oh yeah. No, you've taught me that for sure, dude, honestly. Uh, so if anyone, you know, who's come over from the symbolic study side of things and you're being introduced to chance for the first time. I mean, you know, like what this guy's all about. So if you're really interested in decoding some of these words, uh, like you have like some of the top tier people, like I would argue like on the planet that yeah, come onto your show crazy. and you guys talk about this shit. So it's just amazing stuff, dude. You guys have taught me so much. So yeah, I don't even know um, where you would go to get the deeper end. That's like, how did the, no. how did I get put here? I'm happy about it though. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah, man. But this was a great time, dude. Thanks for hosting and uh, just being so accommodating. And there is a lot more to get to. And there's some very specific astrological prints that my buddy has that would blow your mind, honestly. You know, same era, some of it's kind of new or whatever, not necessarily part of a book, but there's just a lot of things that encode um, more symbolism that I think you guys would be into. So anytime, man. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Uh, anytime you want to come back, there's really no time that's too soon. Um, we can start planning the next one as soon as you want or a topic nice. that sounds fun. Or cool. if you ever get to where you're doing talks on your channel that are not just you. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm in. I'm in. I'll Hell yeah. give, Hell me, yeah. give me a subject. I'll do my best. Oh, I don't sure. know if my slideshow will be as pretty as yours, though. Holy shit. This was gorgeous. <laughs> I've, no, I've, I would love that. I've worked with some ugly slideshows and made it work with people I love. And uh, it's nice that you're so damn professional. Thanks, dude. Yeah, man, you got it. Absolutely. Well, nice. So uh, this was fun. And uh, yeah, more to come. Absolutely. To be continued. To be continued. All right, everybody. And I'm going to go ahead and announce the next Vibrant while I've got a captive audience. Because <laughs> that's going to be something not to miss. We have uh, George Mesa returning with Elsie King to talk about esoteric music theory, continuing that conversation, but with Lucas in the mix. So that's going to be a wild vibrant. I hope you guys are there Wednesday night at eight. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, make sure if you're still listening, Stacy and <laughs> uh, Justin, Justin, get in a hold of Mario for those prints. And dude, thanks for doing that giveaway. That's really, really cool. This has been awesome. Uh, I'm almost having too much fun to end, but we were over <laughs> budget time wise. Not yeah, too yeah. bad though. This was great, yeah. man. Cannot thank you enough. Love you a lot, buddy. Oh man. Love you too, dude. All right. Until next time. All right. See you guys see later. You guys.